the Public Square Media Network presents Gilbert and Jack, What C.S. Lewis Found Reading G.K. Chesterton by Alan C. Duncan, hosted by Joanna Duncan, read by the author, with music by the author, and featuring Rupert Stutchbury as G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis. Preface Playful Pilgrims Lewis liked to sit quietly reading his book with another person. So he would say as he picked up his book, Walter, didn't you bring your book? So he liked to just sit with somebody. Not alone, but with somebody. And then if you had something to contribute, he might talk for a while and then go back to his books. Walter Hooper. My father introduced me to the work of Clive Staples Lewis by the light of a lamppost, as he read the Chronicles of Narnia to me when I was a child. From there, I thumbed the pages of Mere Christianity in college, read The Abolition of Man as a young professional, and worked through the problem of pain as a new parent. C.S. Lewis, known as Jack to family and friends, was a soldier, a scholar, and a writer. He was injured in the Great War, and later broadcast spiritual sanity to his countrymen on the BBC during the Second World War. Lewis lectured at Oxford and Cambridge, wrote poetry, apologetics, science fiction, and children's literature. He even graced the cover of Time magazine in 1947. C.S. Lewis is widely considered the most influential Christian apologist of his time, and his impact is still felt today. The blockbuster films adapted from the Chronicles of Narnia book series have grossed over $1.5 billion worldwide. His books have been translated into over 40 languages, and his Narnian stories alone have sold over 100 million copies. But Lewis didn't write in a vacuum. He, too, drank deeply from the well of previously written words. The Wade Center at Wheaton College houses a significant portion of C.S. Lewis's personal library. They have his copies of Coleridge and Chaucer, Dumas, Doyle, and Dickens, Kipling, Kingsley, Milton, Homer, and certainly Shakespeare. Lewis was an astoundingly well-read man, and even a portion of his library reveals someone who loved, treasured, and simply owned an abundance of books. For our purposes, it's important to know that the beloved British writer Gilbert Keith Chesterton wrote over 20 of the books contained in the C.S. Lewis Library at the Wade Center. Eleven of those have Lewis's handwritten annotations in them. These penciled notes take the form of grammatical corrections, underlines, sparse notes in the margins, and self-made indexes in the empty back pages. Over the years and throughout his collected letters, Lewis references and often recommends Chesterton, particularly The Everlasting Man, calling it the best popular defense of the full Christian position I know. In his autobiography, Lewis wrote of first reading Chesterton while he, Lewis, was still an atheist. He said he couldn't quite understand why he made such an immediate conquest of me, before finally concluding appropriately, I liked him for his goodness. Leave it to Lewis to summarize succinctly and sweetly the feelings of so many. G.K. Chesterton occupies an ecumenical elevation that is perhaps only surpassed by Lewis himself. While Lewis is the Anglican author that attained a Pope's praise, Chesterton is a Catholic writer that even Protestant pastors applaud. Thus, G.K. Chesterton became unavoidable to me. If I wasn't hearing about him from my boss, I was stumbling over commendations of him in online videos, podcasts, and magazine articles. He was everywhere. Perhaps because he conquered virtually every genre of literature at the dawn of the 20th century. Chesterton was an entertaining journalist who also created classic detective fiction, poetry, novels, and apologetic works. I first dipped my toe in Chesterton's tide by way of his published newspaper debate, The Blatchford Controversies. Next, I picked up Heretics, and by the time I was seven sentences in, my pencil was out and I was marking the book. Two pages later, I knew I would never be the same. And I'm glad I can look back now on my own scribbled notes. Ebenezer's to life change, etched in number two, graphite. And such is the wonder of real, handwritten marginalia in an age of tablets and audiobooks. We can look at a book that changed us long ago, 
and snap instantly back to the inspired spark that made us halt everything and jot that note. And while our own underlined books are fantastic for self-reflection, we engage in a treasure hunt when flipping through the copies of a luminary like Lewis. So it's in that spirit that my father and I made a pilgrimage from our homes in Cleveland, Ohio, to the Wade Center. After all, my dad had introduced me to Lewis, so it was only right that we share the experience of looking through his annotated library together. But how do we come to find out that such riches existed at all? From a podcast. In the episode titled C.S. Lewis vs. Chesterton Debate of Uncommon Sense with Nancy Brown, Dr. Dale Alquist, president of the Society of Gilbert Keith Chesterton, and apologist Peter S. Williams engaged in a friendly contest. The entire program is fun and worth a listen, but I'm particularly grateful for the part where Dale Alquist informed listeners that Lewis's copies of Chesterton books were out there, somewhere, with notes in their margins. At that point, all it took was some web searching to discover that much of Lewis's library is indeed stored at the lovely Marion E. Wade Center in Wheaton, Illinois. Now, I was very happy about this, because I'd worried that anything owned by Lewis would be in England. When we did finally see the Wade Center, it looked like it was part of a new Oxford slowly sprouting one building at a time from the Illinois soil. Once through its doors, we found ourselves in the Kilby Reading Room, whose walls are lined with books. We wondered why white gloves were not mandated after we learned of the protocol for our study at the Wade Center. No pens, only pencils. No photographs. Books must be kept at or above tabletop level. Only one book at a time can be released to you. Security cameras are fully functional. Big Brother is watching. And when placing the books on the table, put them on the fluffy little pillow that is provided. So we sat up straight, awed to be handling treasured tomes from C.S. Lewis's personal library. But the strict rules and the regulations did what the law does. It called us from the dark side. After we had sat nicely in silent study for some time, I whispered to my dad, I found a marking that isn't in their database. Do you think I should tell them? Sure, said my dad. I think they'd want to know that they missed something. So I made my way to the desk and then came back sheepishly to my seat. She said, thank you, but it is in our database. You must have missed it when you recorded the notations before you came. You have to get up pretty early to find something that the librarians and researchers didn't spot already. I guess so. A few hours later, my dad noticed another possible omission. Should I point it out? He asked. No, don't embarrass yourself, I replied. He shared it anyway. It turns out it was something they had missed. My father punctuated his feeling and their admission with a fist pump. I guess he got up early enough after all. The tentative relationship we first had with the librarians seemed to develop into something more. After all, we were at the center from opening to closing time. Over and over, all day long, books were passed back and forth. Perhaps our obvious pleasure in the books and the fact that we treated them as the treasures that they are gave our librarians reason to trust us, maybe even like us. They began to relax and smile at the muted rowdiness from the father-son combo. The bridges we built with them were a welcome friendship in more ways than one. Because as it turned out, it wasn't going to be the last time we'd need those long-suffering librarians. Once back in Ohio, we selected several of our favorite spots in Lewis's Chesterton books that caused him to stop and underline a sentence right in the margin or create an index in the back flaps of his carefully preserved copies. We then sought to find parallel thoughts in Lewis's own writing and allowed our minds to dance around the themes. We soon saw this book project of our own taking shape, and the writing began. I would write and then email chapters to my dad. He'd send them back with notes and suggestions. At some point during the whole process, I have a vague memory of my wife, Joanna, asking with all the lucidity of common sense how we knew for sure that the annotations we had studied were actually from C.S. Lewis, from his own hand. My wife has a tendency to do this, to bring up the very thing you'd rather not hear, but need to. It's one of the reasons I've often told her that I need to read 10 good books just to get to where she was all along. 
I've lost count of the number of times I've brought an epiphany to her from my time reading Chesterton or Lewis, only to watch her kindly struggle to hide an expression that can only be summed up by the phrase, Of course. Naturally, I tried to push her question as far into the back of my mind as I could. But in fact, I had privately been wondering the same thing myself. But these notes were cataloged and preserved by the Wade Center. Wasn't that enough proof of their authenticity? It was going to have to be. I kept writing. I was eight chapters into the first draft of this book when I discovered a man by the name of Charlie Starr among the members of the C.S. Lewis and the Inkling Society group on a certain social media platform. Dr. Starr is a deeply respected Lewis researcher. He has written the books Light, C.S. Lewis's first and final short story, and The Fawn's Bookshelf, C.S. Lewis on Why Myth Matters. Dr. Starr has also published an essay titled Villainous Handwriting, a Chronological Study of C.S. Lewis's Script that appeared in Volume 33 of 7, the Journal of the Marion E. Wade Center. It turns out Charlie Starr is basically the Lewis handwriting expert. He has studied decades of Lewis's letters and discovered distinct writing styles. Among these are traditional cursive, the Great War G, classic Lewis style, and more. For those interested, I highly recommend reading Starr's important work in this field. Not only can Starr accurately determine if a piece of writing is from Lewis's hand, but also, given a quality sample, can approximate the date that the text was written. Once we found Charlie Starr, we now had no excuse. We had to confirm if the annotations were genuine Lewis. No matter what the result, we had to know the truth. Dr. Starr graciously agreed to review our findings. But there was a problem. Because we were not legally allowed to take photographs of the notes while we were at the Wade Center, we couldn't send Dr. Starr any images, any samples. So we reached out to our librarian friends again and hoped they remembered us fondly. The staff was indeed kind, but they informed us that before they could send any photocopies to Dr. Starr for examination, we'd have to get permission directly from the Lewis Company. We sent our request and waited. And waited. And waited. During this time, and perhaps to pass the anxious days, I reached out to Walter Hooper, C.S. Lewis's literary executor, and the man responsible for saving many works from being discarded after Lewis's passing. I hoped Mr. Hooper could shed some light on our predicament, so I asked him by email, Do you have any insights you'd be willing to share about Lewis's habits of marking his books in general, or any copies in particular? We found several with lists in the rear paste down, sparse notes in the margins, and some underlining. Does this sound familiar to you? To my delight, Mr. Hooper responded almost at once. But to my dismay, he didn't exactly quell my questions about the authenticity of the annotations. He wrote, Dear Mr. Duncan, thank you for your email. As to Lewis's annotations in the Chesterton book you and your father have looked at, I suppose you compared the annotations to some of the thousands of letters from Lewis in the Wade Center. I will mention that, I think in 1965, Lewis's library, then at Roxton College near Oxford, I was invited to see the library in its new setting. I was taken to meet a young American student who was copying Lewis's annotations from a book. The young lady was preparing a paper on Lewis's annotations. She had no experience of Lewis's handwriting. I'm afraid I broke her heart by pointing out that the annotations in that particular book were not by Lewis. In the Oxford of that time, there were no end of second-hand bookshops. And if a Don needed a particular book, long out of print, he would search for it in one of the second-hand shops. Don's and others were always selling the books they had no more use for and buying other second-hand books. The girl at Roxton, like most Americans, assumed that you bought your books new and kept them all your life. It was an easy mistake to make. My point being that, in some cases, the annotations in Lewis's books might not be written by Lewis. At the same time, I've never known anyone who wrote so many annotations in his books as did C.S. Lewis. I've always found a passage about his hobby written to Arthur Greaves in February 1932 enjoyable. It is found in Collected Letters, Volume 2, page 53, Letter to Arthur Greaves of February 1932. He wrote, To enjoy a book like that thoroughly, I find I have to treat it as a sort of hobby and set about it seriously. Seriously. 
I begin by making a map on one of the end leaves. Then I put in a genealogical tree or two. Then I put a running headline at the top of each page. Finally, at the end, I index all the passages I have for any reason underlined. I often wonder, considering how people enjoy themselves developing photos or making scrapbooks, why so few people make a hobby of their reading in this way. Many an otherwise dull book which I had read have I enjoyed in this way with a fine nib pen in my hand. One is making something all the time, and a book so read acquires the charm of a toy without losing that of a book. I have a good many books annotated by Lewis. Sometimes in a rare work he might supply his own index of unusual terms or index of words he wanted to remember, and sometimes with running headlines on most pages. All good wishes from Walter Hooper. It was an exceedingly warm response, but as I said, it didn't exactly fill me with confidence. I talked this over with my dad. Were we simply making the same mistake another American had made all those years before? My father pointed out that we had found no maps, not a single genealogical tree or running headline, nor did we find marks in pen. We had found a preponderance of pencil. Things were not looking good. Even still, we did find several of those indexes referencing back to passages that had been underlined. And hadn't Mr. Hooper left us hope, too? After all, he told us he'd never known anyone who wrote so many annotations in his books. At last, the Lewis Company granted permission for the Wade Center to scan and send the selected notes off to Charlie Starr. This was the moment of truth. Would our hopes be dashed like the poor American girl? Would our work be in vain? After a few anxious days, we had our answer. Regarding the handwritten note in the rear paste down of heretics, Dr. Starr assured us, yes, it's Lewis. How about the index in the rear flyleaf of fancies versus fads? Yes, it's Lewis. And the full handwritten index in the rear flyleaf verso of orthodoxy? It's definitely Lewis. We were grateful for all the generous help, and we were back in business. Now, in this preface, it must also be admitted that this volume is not intended to be a literary critical contribution. Certainly, research has gone into crafting this book, but we aren't claiming to proffer any new theory or to settle any specific points of contention. Thus, this book is more personal, more devotional, than it is academic. Even still, it is our prayer that this book will find its way into the hands of individuals, small groups, and yes, even the classrooms of people who'd like to reflect more deeply on the impact G.K. Chesterton had on C.S. Lewis. That said, I also acknowledge that it's nearly impossible to trace someone's personal beliefs or philosophy to a single source. Chesterton himself wrote in Orthodoxy that one was often convinced of a philosophy from four books, one battle, one landscape, and one old friend. So our little volume doesn't presume to say that a man of Lewis's intellect, spirit, and breadth of reading acquired these specific thoughts we will focus on from G.K. Chesterton alone. And of course, anyone familiar with the work of the two men can already find similarities in their writings. But these personal handwritten annotations do give us a unique glimpse into the passages that actually prompted Lewis to stop and think while reading Chesterton. We cannot tell you exactly why Lewis made these notes. Maybe they were jotted because he already agreed with them, and they echoed something he had read in Scripture, the philosophers, or a fairy tale. Or perhaps they did indeed introduce a new thought to his mind. We can't say for certain. It's also worth mentioning here that our study of Lewis's notes in Orthodoxy will comprise the entire second half of this volume. The quantity and quality of Lewis's notes in that book yielded much compelling material. The book is also a favorite of Chesterton enthusiasts and one of the most recommended of all his books. With all that being said, this entire pursuit could be considered mere intellectual indulgence if we didn't approach it with regard to the actual content. Were the writings we meditated on true, reasonable, and biblical? Could they bring us closer to God? Could God use these concepts to change our thoughts and our actions for good? So as my father and I think back to our time turning the pages of Lewis's library under the friendly yet watchful eye of the Wade Center staff, I can't help but think of the Walter Hooper quote that began this preface. <laughs>
about his friend's love of reading with another person. While my father and I quietly uncovered the quotes Lewis had underlined and nudged each other at certain key findings, I felt we were following in that tradition. It seemed that we had stepped through a wardrobe and found ourselves in the kilns. And since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, maybe I can be excused for feeling like we were somehow reading with Gilbert and Jack. It was as if Lewis had just finished making a note and was ready for the conversation to begin. Chapter 1. Smiths and Signal Boxes This was the language spoken before the fall and beyond the moon, and the meanings were not given to the syllables by chance, or skill, or long tradition, but truly inherent in them as the shape of the great sun is inherent in the little water drop. This was language herself. C.S. Lewis, That Hideous Strength In his introduction to his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis gives us a quick look at his linguistic theory. He writes, Language is not an infallible guide, but it contains, with all its defects, a good deal of stored insight and experience. If you begin by flouting it, it has a way of avenging itself later on. We had better not follow Humpty Dumpty in making words mean whatever we please. A misuse of language was something G.K. Chesterton warned against as well. Therefore, a particular handwritten annotation in Lewis's copy of Heretics shouldn't surprise us. Before looking at that note, however, it should be mentioned that Heretics is the 1905 classic in which Chesterton took on the fads and famous figures of his time. In his characteristically genial way, he jousted with the ideas of writers like George Moore, George Bernard Shaw, and H.G. Wells. It's a book that all these years later still retains its freshness because it seems that we always find a way to reframe our fashions. In light pencil on the rear paste down page of his small hardback copy, Jack wrote the words Smith and Signal Boxes. It's preceded by a numeral 32, reminding Lewis that this section begins on that page in the chapter called On Mr. Rudyard Kipling and Making the World Small. The paragraphs Lewis was referring to are among the most visually stunning in the book and are in fact marked in my copy as well. In the first part of that text, and in his quest to show us that everything is poetical, G.K. Chesterton reminds us, as only he can, of the epic history of the common surname Smith. In the case of Smith, the name is so poetical that it must be an arduous and heroic matter for the man to live up to it. The name of Smith is the name of the one trade that even kings respected. It could claim half the glory of that arma virumque, which all epics acclaimed. The spirit of the smithy is so close to the spirit of song that it has mixed in a million poems, and every blacksmith is a harmonious blacksmith. Even the village children feel that in some dim way the smith is poetic, as the grocer and the cobbler are not poetic, when they feast on the dancing sparks and deafening blows in the cavern of that creative violence, the brute repose of nature, the passionate cunning of man, the strongest of earthly metals, the weirdest of earthly elements, the unconquerable iron subdued by its only conqueror, the wheel and the plowshare, the sword and the steam hammer, the arraying of armies and the whole legend of arms, all these things are written, briefly indeed, but quite legibly, on the visiting guard of Mr. Smith. Yet our novelists call their hero uh, Elmer Valance, which means nothing, or, or Vernon Raymond, which means nothing, when it is in their power to give him the sacred name of Smith, this name made of iron and flame. <laughs> 
It would be very natural if a certain hauteur, a certain carriage of the head, a certain curl of the lip, distinguished everyone whose name is Smith. Perhaps it does. I, I trust so. Whoever else are parvenus, the Smiths are not parvenus. From the darkest dawn of history, this clan has gone forth to battle. Its trophies are on every hand. Its name is everywhere. It is older than the nations. Its sign is the hammer of Thor. I, for one, know I'll never look at a phone book the same way again. It's often said that a great orator can read the phone book and make it interesting. We now know that G.K. Chesterton could rewrite it and make it sing. He has crafted a ballad to literally the most common name in all of the United States, Australia, and United Kingdom. We may be tempted to think this was simply some elaborate linguistic gymnastics. It is not. Chesterton has shown us that even the most common names may actually have hidden depths of meaning in them. But he goes on to say that this is not quite the usual case. He tells us that though many common things have poetry inherent to them, most common names we use do not. The names we choose actually tend to stand in the way of our seeing the poetry of the thing. To show this, he calls our attention to the small buildings that house the operators of railway signals. The word signal box is unpoetical, but the thing signal box is not unpoetical. It is a place where men, in an agony of vigilance, light blood red and sea green fires to keep other men from death. That is the plain, genuine description of, of what it is. The prose only comes in with what it is called. All these things were given to you poetical. It is only by a long and elaborate process of literary effort that you have made them prosaic. For his part, Lewis also writes like he's waging a personal war against such slippage. So it's not hard to picture Lewis pausing after reading those passages, flipping to the back, and jotting his note. After all, Lewis is the author who brought us a marsh wiggle named Puddle Glum, the demons Screw Tape and Wormwood, the planet Paralandra, and the wonderful world of Narnia itself. And of course, he aptly named Aslan using the Turkish word for lion. Lewis can never be accused of giving any characters prosaic names. And I wonder if the section from Heretics inspired any of his creative drive in that direction. The names I just mentioned give a genuine sense of the value of what they describe. That said, Lewis also knew when to control his creativity and just give a character an existing name, like Smith, that's inherently imbued with symbol and song. Perhaps that's why, in a series full of reepicheeps and rabidashes, the High King of Narnia is a human, fittingly called Peter. It is he that Aslan benights, rise up Sir Peter Wolfsbane. Peter is the rock-like eldest Pevensey, the granite-strong Lord of Care Paravel. By calling such a character by the familiar name Peter, Lewis reminds us that the commonplace can contain fathoms of meaning. In Lewis's harrowing work, The Screwtape Letters, the evil Screwtape instructs his nephew how to keep the human in his charge away from God. In aid to that effort, he writes, Keep pressing home on him the ordinariness of things. He says this will keep the man from thinking about realities he can't touch and see. The demons strive to keep the man from seeing behind the veil of real life and into the poetic spiritual realm all around him. Everything must be seen as ordinary, humdrum, routine. See, when one limits language, one clouds the mind. But when wielded appropriately, words and names are swords that pierce the dark canopy of the prosaic, letting pinpricks of poetic truth reach us like stars. Chesterton and Lewis are battle-tested knights in that regard, offering us the reminder that there is actual meaning in the world. There is a creator. We are not him and proper poetical naming helps set our place among his world. 
There may be some who think poetic language is only capable of communicating emotions, nothing more, and that the use of such language pales in comparison to the exact semantics of science. C.S. Lewis addresses this objection in his paper, The Language of Religion. He makes the case that most of our everyday experiences, especially but not limited to our sense experiences, can only be best described using poetic language. He writes, In all our joys and sorrows, religious, aesthetic, or natural, I seem to find things almost incredibly thus. They are about something. The very essence of our life as conscious beings, all day and every day, consists of something which cannot be communicated except by hints, similes, metaphors, and the use of emotions, themselves not very important, which appoint us to it. Chesterton also played with this concept of poetry as a pointer to deeper truth in his collection of essays, Fancies versus Fads. He makes a fascinating case that the truest name for any given thing might actually be a poem. We shouldn't be surprised that once again we find Lewis making note of Gilbert's words. As he did in many of his books, Lewis made his own handwritten index in the rear flyleaf verso of his 1925 edition of Chesterton's Fancies. In that list, Lewis jotted the phrase, The fact of a potato is poetical. 77. The note corresponds to a passage in which Chesterton has written about the humble tuber. If a man could ask for a potato in the form of a poem, the poem would not be merely a more romantic, but a more realistic rendering of a potato. For a potato is a poem. It is even an ascending scale of poems, beginning at the root in subterranean grotesques in the Gothic manner, with humps like deformities of a goblin and eyes like a beast of revelation, and rising up through the green shades of the earth to a crown that has the shape of stars and the hue of heaven. But the truth behind all this is expressed in that very ancient mystical notion the music of the spheres, it is the idea that at the back of everything, existence begins with a harmony and not a chaos. If we really believe that God's invisible attributes, eternal power, and divine nature are observed through creation, then why would we tolerate a world with dull, unpoetic names? After all, the Hebrew scriptures, and therefore all Christian Bibles, start with poetic language declaring this foundational truth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's also no small fact that the first man was tasked with naming all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. We were always meant to name. God assigned Adam with a symbolic, practical, and poetic act that placed his image bearers in benevolent dominion over creation. Just imagine the poetry present in the pre-fall garden. Envision Adam in the infancy of earth thinking with the freshness of a child savant on his first trip to Whipsnade Zoo. Perhaps the first bull's name was a ballad, and the first lamb's was a limerick, and maybe, just maybe, the first songbird's name was a sonnet. In that Genesis garden, all things were new and good, and man's first creative acts flowed directly from a God-given commission. But such ecstasy was not to last. The fall occurred. And as Chesterton rightly discerned, this has affected that first command to name things properly. Ever since, we have felt the pull toward the prosaic. This has tarnished how we see the world and our God who made it. It may seem extravagant to insist that our misuse of words highlights our fallen state. But since God uses his works to speak about himself, our amnesia toward inherent meaning can shrink our view of him. It's one glaring flare that shows humanity's sinful separation from our maker. Apart from Christ, this is our plight. But Lewis draws from the depths of gospel truth to remind us of the Redeemer. In The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there is an exchange between the rightfully indignant Mr. Beaver and Aslan that gives narrative weight and ultimate hope to Chesterton's thoughts from heretics. Sire, 
There is a messenger from the enemy who craves audience. Let him approach, said Aslan. The leopard went away and soon returned, leading the witch's dwarf. What is your message, son of earth? asked Aslan. The queen of Narnia and empress of the Lone Islands desires a safe conduct to come and speak with you on a matter which is as much to your advantage as to hers. Queen of Narnia, indeed, said Mr. Beaver. Have all the cheek. Peace, Beaver, said Aslan. All names will soon be restored to their proper owners. We see that though things are often misnamed in our sinful world, eventually they will be set right. When the one who truly restores chose Simon, he changed his name to Cephas, to Peter, to a rock. But do we know that Scripture tells us that one day every believer in Christ will get a new name? In the second chapter of Revelation, we are promised, To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Unlike Peter, we don't know our new name. Not yet. It's to be revealed. But meanwhile, let's anticipate our new names and long for that intimate moment with the one who makes all things new. How fitting that the Rock of Ages, who named his follower Cephas, would give us our name, written on stone, as if etched, perhaps with a chisel forged by a heavenly smith or the very finger of God. Chapter 2. His Own Name In your world, I have another name. You must learn to know me by that name. Aslan, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader C.S. Lewis owned a first edition of St. Thomas Aquinas by G.K. Chesterton. The blue hardback volume, published by Hodder and Stoughton Limited in 1933, is considered by many Aquinas scholars to be the best biography ever written about the great theologian. It felt light in my hand, especially considering its weighty content. On the final page of the chapter, A Meditation on the Manichees, Lewis drew a thin vertical pencil line in the left-hand margin. This marked off the final paragraph for his memory. It reads, The Arabs have a phrase about the hundred names of God, but they also inherit the tradition of a tremendous name, unspeakable, because it expresses being itself, dumb and yet dreadful as an instant inaudible shout, the proclamation of the absolute, and perhaps no other man, Thomas Aquinas, ever came so near to calling the Creator by his own name, which can only be written, I am. At such a conclusion to the chapter, Lewis broke forth in what must have been praise. Next to the pencil line was also written a merry ho-ho, as jolly as a laugh from Father Christmas himself. It seems this was something Lewis loved so much that he stopped to record his laugh. My dad and I couldn't help but laugh ourselves when we saw it and joked that we found the mid-century British version of LOL. I suspect we drew an exasperated glance from the kindly library staff as our joking broke the silence of the room. Looking back, it shouldn't have come as a surprise that Lewis would single out such a passage. In his beloved apologetic mere Christianity, Lewis revels in the infinite, self-sufficient nature of God. In the chapter Time and Beyond Time, Lewis writes of God... His life is not dribbled out moment by moment like ours, for his life is himself. In his spiritual autobiography, Surprised by Joy, Lewis also wrote, God is to be obeyed because of what he is in himself. If you ask why we should obey God, in the last resort the answer is, I am. In his Narnian adventure, The Horse and His Boy, Lewis also minds this truth. In the chapter titled The Unwelcome Fellow Traveler, a very large, very mysterious creature was following the boy, Shasta, when he was lost and alone in dense fog and forest. The boy was crying, he was cold and feeling like he was the unluckiest person in the world. But then, very high up on a mountain pass, after he poured out his problems to this mysterious creature, Aslan revealed himself in a triune declaration. Who are you? 
asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice, very deep and low, so that the earth shook and again, Myself, loud and clear and gay. And then the third time, Myself, self, 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 whispered so softly you could hardly hear it, and yet it seemed to come from all around you as if the leaves rustled with it. Like Moses in the glow of the burning bush, all the boy could do was hide his face as Aslan made his acquaintance. Shasta knew he was on holy ground, and such passages were reminded that God's self-existence is often sufficient introduction. On some level, it must be enough for us to know that he knows himself. We must begin by taking him at his word. It's difficult, if not impossible, for us to fully grasp God's I am name because finite creatures can't comprehend eternal self-sustained existence. In fact, the angel of the Lord says in the book of Judges, Why do you ask my name? It is beyond understanding. And in another version, Why askest thou thus after my name? Seeing it is secret. Of course, we know that ultimately, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And by some counts, there are over 900 names of God in the Bible. Thankfully, those names have not been kept secret. In fact, this is precisely why Jesus came, to reveal the nature, the character, the attributes, and the image of God. Any attempt here to detail a comprehensive list of the names and titles of Jesus found in Scripture will no doubt be incomplete and inadequate. Still, the effort reminds us of the glory, majesty, and uniqueness of this one we call Christ. He is the Prince of Peace, the Bread of Life, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, the Redeemer, the Door, the Way, the Truth, and the Life. Meditating on these names and titles of Jesus expands our capacity for wonder and worship. So God is certainly not averse to more literal or knowable names. But even still, there runs that mysterious current of self-sufficient secrecy in Scripture as well. The 19th chapter of Revelation gives us a heavenly vision of our Lord. Here we see a vision of Jesus, once crucified for our sins, now resurrected, crowned with many crowns and riding a white horse. Here we see him judging and waging war with justice, his eyes blazing like fire. On his blood-dipped robe and on his thigh is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We are told his name is the Word of God. But tucked in the middle of this staggering account is a mysterious fact about another name of our Lord. Here we learn that Jesus has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. We are left wondering at such a sacred secret. Why does our Savior have such a name inscribed? Why such concealment? And just how is it concealed if it is indeed written on him? Are we to understand that its revelation will be at the moment of his return? Does this name refer to our incomplete, finite understanding of his already revealed names? Does the scripture here refer to our inability to know any name of God apart from direct revelation? Could it also be that this unrevealed name is one way that God stokes our hunger to learn, grow, and know him better throughout all eternity? The head spins. The everlasting God is knowable and unknowable, named and unnamed, seen and unseen. Some things are meant to be mysterious. So if we are ever permitted to hear this name that seems literally impossible for us to take in vain, what might it describe about Jesus and what feelings of terrible awe and satisfying security might well up within us? Like the Pevensey children at their first hearing of Aslan's name in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, might we feel brave and adventurous? Might it hint of music or the holidays? Might some feel a mysterious horror should we ever be privileged to learn this name, I do feel safe in presuming one thing. We should know him by it. Chapter 3. Goblins and Goodness Every good and perfect gift is from above, 
coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. James 1, 17. In addition to a significant portion of C.S. Lewis's personal library, the Marion E. Wade Center of Wheaton College is devoted to the pages and paraphernalia of six other British authors, Owen Barfield, Dorothy L. Sayers, J.R.R. Tolkien, Charles Williams, G.K. Chesterton, of course, and George MacDonald. Barfield, Williams, and Tolkien were peers, friends, and members of the Inklings with Lewis. Sayers was also a contemporary and is known to have communicated with Williams and Lewis. So there was mutual respect, admiration, and iron sharpening among those five. But Chesterton and MacDonald inhabit a place of chronological primacy among these seven names, while occupying a special place in C.S. Lewis's journey to faith as well. In fact, Lewis would eventually write, I was brought back by the strong influence of two writers, George MacDonald and G.K. Chesterton. Remarkably, if not surprisingly, as we will later see, MacDonald influenced Chesterton as well. The bearded Scott preacher George MacDonald was born in 1824 and was in many ways a forerunner of the thoughts that would flourish in Oxford during the middle of the 20th century. Lewis himself famously acknowledged MacDonald's and Chesterton's influence on him in this humorous passage from Surprised by Joy. In reading Chesterton, as in reading MacDonald, I did not know what I was letting myself in for. A young man who wishes to remain a sound atheist cannot be too careful of his reading. There are traps everywhere. Bibles laid open. Millions of surprises, as Herbert says. Fine nets and stratagems. God is, if I may say it, quite unscrupulous. One such stratagem grasped Lewis as a teen when his eyes happened to fall upon George MacDonald's novel, Fantasties, on a railway platform bookstall. Lewis would buy the book and later claim that his imagination was baptized in the pages of the magical woodland world inside. Thus began a lifelong apprenticeship. In his tender and lengthy preface to his collection, George MacDonald, an anthology, Lewis wrote, I have never concealed the fact that I regarded MacDonald as my master. Indeed, I fancy I have never written a book in which I did not quote from him. Knowing this, it was special to find a first-hand account of Lewis reading Chesterton's appraisal of his early spiritual hero. On page 152 in C.S. Lewis's personal copy of G.K. Chesterton's book, The Victorian Age in Literature, there's an obvious double pencil line in the left-hand margin, much like the line accompanying that ho-ho annotation we found in Aquinas. The marks here seem darker than many of his other handwritten annotations in the book, and they coincide with the following section, in which Chesterton wrote, George MacDonald, a, a Scot of genius, as genuine as Thomas Carlyle's. He could write fairy tales that made all experience a fairy tale. He could give the real sense that everyone had the end of an elfin thread that must at last lead them into paradise. It was a sort of optimist Calvinism. Now, now, this passage is notable in no small part because it might be the most sympathetic words Chesterton ever wrote about someone he considered Calvinistic. But it's no wonder Lewis would mark these lines for remembrance because in the preface to his George MacDonald anthology, Lewis himself penned something strikingly similar of MacDonald. He wrote, The quality which had enchanted me in his imaginative works turned out to be the quality of the real universe, the divine, magical terrifying and ecstatic reality in which we all live. Gilbert and Jack were both drawn to MacDonald's belief that the world is a truly magical place because that's how God has actually created it. Four years prior to the publication of Victorian Age, when he was asked to write the introduction to the book George MacDonald and His Wife, G.K. Chesterton had already addressed this theme. He used that platform to describe how MacDonald's fairy story, The Princess and the Goblin, impacted him as a child. That book tells of a young princess who was wooed by a mysterious and magical great-grandmother while at the same time being pursued by grotesque subterranean goblins. Yeah. Out of all the stories he had read, this is the tale that Chesterton insists remains the most real, the most realistic, 
in the exact sense of the phrase, the most like life. I felt the whole thing was happening inside a real human house, not essentially unlike the house I was living in. To Chesterton, the work of other writers, hardly suggests how near both the best and the worst things are to us from the first, even perhaps especially in the first. He would go on to say that MacDonald reinforced this philosophy by making all the ordinary staircases and doors and windows into magical things. No doubt Chesterton was recalling passages like this from his childhood reading of The Princess and the Goblin. MacDonald wrote, But when she came to the foot of the old staircase, there was the moon shining down from some window high up and making the worm-eaten oak look very strange and delicate and lovely. In a moment, she was putting her little feet one after the other in the silvery path up the stair, looking behind as she went to see the shadow they made in the middle of the silver. Some little girls would have been afraid to find themselves thus alone in the middle of the night, but Irene was a princess. As she went slowly up the stair, not quite sure that she was not dreaming, suddenly a great longing woke up in her heart to try once more whether she could not find the old lady with the silvery hair. Despite all the beauty and wonder in MacDonald's work, and for all the influence he had on Chesterton and Lewis, he remains a controversial figure in Christianity. In recent years, there have even been prominent pastors to publicly question his salvation. For many, his beliefs about the atonement, quote, Jesus, our propitiation, our atonement, he is the head and leader, the prince of atonement. He could not do it without us, but he leads us to the Father's knee. He makes us make atonement. End quote. And his universalism, quote, he will hold his children in the consuming fire of his distance until they pay the uttermost farthing and rush home to the Father and the Son. End quote. Quotes like this have put him, if it may be said, near the shadowlands of orthodoxy. This is to be expected and even understandable. But for those who would easily dismiss him, surely there is something worth hewing from the works of a man who could write such words as these, quote, God is simply and altogether our friend, our father, our more than friend, father and mother, our infinite love, perfect God. And I dare not say with Paul that I am the slave of Christ, but my highest aspiration and desire is to be the slave of Christ, end quote. MacDonald's body of work is so replete with such passages, it's hard to fathom anyone reading him and not feeling conviction of sin and a deeper love for God our Father. But the all-consuming father love that held MacDonald's gaze may, if possible, have also blinded him to some of the harder sayings of the son. And this is where Lewis himself could follow his, quote, master no further. Once saying of MacDonald's universalism, I parted company from MacDonald on that point because a higher authority, the dominical utterances themselves, seem to me irreconcilable with universalism. After all, it was Jesus himself who said of his father who sees the sparrows and numbers the hairs on our head, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Terrifying. I mentioned previously that Lewis wrote of G.K. Chesterton, strange as it may seem, I liked him for his goodness. Should it be any wonder that despite their distinctions, Lewis resonated with the same virtue in MacDonald as well? Speaking of MacDonald's 1858 fantasy novel in the preface of Anthology, he said, I should have been shocked in my teens if anyone had told me that what I had learned to love in Fantasties was goodness. Perhaps ultimately, it was Lewis's goodness that allowed him to see through the doctrinal differences or deficiencies that have daunted some. Perhaps it was his goodness that let him look instead at the heart of an author who tried all his life to remind us that we have a father who loves us, this father who gave his only son and from whose spirit flows the fruit of all genuine goodness. No matter how one ultimately views the work of MacDonald, those of us who have been touched by the ministry of C.S. Lewis must look with affection on the day he providentially purchased fantasies from that railway platform.
Since that day, God continued his sovereign work in leading him to salvation. If our Heavenly Father saw fit to use such a seemingly chance encounter to reignite the faith of one of the great apologists, then maybe McDonald's fairy tale magic really is at play in this world. In the light of such a thought, I imagine many of us can also fondly recall moments when God's hand has guided our lives. Surely we can all give thanks for the goodness of our unscrupulous God. Chapter 4. Easy to Please Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 through 30. Some sayings float in the atmosphere. We know them, or some version of them. We vaguely recall hearing them and can't remember a time that we didn't know them. The phrase, God is easy to please, but hard to satisfy, was like that for me. My notion that Lewis himself had written the phrase probably sprang from a forgetful reading of this passage in Mere Christianity. This helper, who will in the long run be satisfied with nothing less than absolute perfection, will also be delighted with the first feeble, stumbling effort you make tomorrow to do the simplest duty. As a great Christian writer, George MacDonald, pointed out, every father is pleased at the baby's first attempt to walk. No father would be satisfied with anything less than a firm, free, manly walk in a grown-up son. In the same way, he said, God is easy to please but hard to satisfy. Had I remembered correctly, I would have known that Lewis credited MacDonald. I should also admit that even months after my visit to the Wade Center, I couldn't find the original source of the quote that Lewis was referencing. At that point, I'd only been able to find MacDonald's famous adage quoted by others. But when I began working through a collection of MacDonald's sermons, I finally found it in a sermon entitled The Father's Appeal, preached in Westminster Chapel. He said this, You have not much to offer. I know. Who of us has? But remember this, that though Jesus Christ is hard to satisfy, he is very easy to please. Think of that, and it will help you a little. He is very easy to please, but very hard to satisfy. The thought is so profound and pure, it's no wonder the words have been passed down through the years. If we truly believe this is how God sees us, we will be better equipped to view ourselves and others the same way. As a parent, I long to emulate this image of God. In my better moments, I seek to celebrate even the smallest glimpses of progress in my children, but still I never stop encouraging their growth into the adults I know they can be. This concept also brings to mind the best type of coaches and the finest music teachers. Such mentors cheer our mastering of the most basic concepts, but won't rest until they see us hoisting a trophy or hosting a concert. For G.K. Chesterton, as we'll see, this concept even applied to art criticism. In the previous chapter, we touched on Chesterton's fondness for MacDonald, and here again we'll get to see Lewis's reaction to finding Gilbert quoting the Scot. In his handwritten index in the back of Fancies versus Fads, Lewis wrote, Easy to please, 16. Noting that Chesterton referenced George MacDonald's famous quote on page 16 of his copy. Once we flipped back to that page, we saw a double line in the margin marking off this passage from Chesterton. A good critic should be like God in the great saying of a Scottish mystic. George MacDonald said that God was easy to please and hard to satisfy. That paradox is the poise of all good artistic appreciation. Without the first part of the paradox, uh, appreciation perishes because it loses the power to appreciate. Chesterton goes on to clarify in his next sentence that good criticism, I repeat, combines the subtle pleasure in a thing being done well with the simple pleasure 
it ain't being done at all. As with his poetry and his mystery stories, even Chesterton's comments on art criticism are naturally infused with his faith. It's one of the reasons that reading him is so rich. His writings are enjoyable on a purely formal level, but the experience deepens when one is open to his many spiritual insights. After all, who else would dare to favorably compare an art critic with God? Chesterton further illustrates his point with three examples. He reminds us that there's beauty in an engineer looking at the function of wheels and a baby's pleasure in seeing them spin. He writes about a draftsman's pleasure in the perfection of his charcoal lines and a child's appreciation that chalk makes any marks at all. He finally concludes his point by affirming a critic's appreciation of a poem and a child's enjoyment of a simple rhyme. See what he's doing there? It's fascinating for me to imagine Lewis, a literary critic, reading Chesterton's thoughts on the craft, especially since a memorable McDonald's saying sparked those thoughts. Amid his enduring renown as a fantasy author and apologist, it can be easy to forget that C.S. Lewis was in fact a literary critic as well. He published his first academic volume, The Allegory of Love, A Study in Medieval Tradition, in 1936. In that book, he traced the development of chivalric or courtly love through the singers, storytellers, and poets of the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. In addition to many critical essays and commentaries, Lewis also published A Preface to Paradise Lost and English Literature in the 16th Century, Excluding Drama. As a fellow and tutor in English literature at Magdalen College, Oxford, and later chair of medieval and Renaissance literature at Magdalen College, Cambridge, Lewis was supremely qualified to write on these subjects. When Jack again turned his pen to literary criticism in his book, An Experiment in Criticism, he worked to modify our definition of what a good book really is. Against both the uninterested tastes of, quote, unliterary readers, and the priggish gatekeeping of the, quote, style mongers, Lewis ultimately defines a good book as one which, quote, permits and invites a good reading. It's a beautifully broad definition, especially for someone as steeped in the classics as Lewis. It's a definition that even allowed maligned genres like science fiction back into the literary discussion. In experiment, Lewis also engaged with and quoted various works of famed Victorian-era critic Matthew Arnold to help him build his own case. But tucked among those Arnold quotes, I found another reference that took me right back to the Wade Center, right back to Lewis's copy of Fancies vs. Fads. At the end of a key paragraph was a direct instance of Lewis referencing Chesterton, referencing MacDonald. The great art of criticism is to get oneself out of the way and to let humanity decide. We are to show others the work they claim to admire or despise as it really is, to describe almost to define its character, then leave them to their own, now better informed reactions. In one place, the critic is even warned not to adopt a ruthless perfectionism. He is to keep his idea of the best of perfection, and at the same time to be willingly accessible to every second best which offers itself. He is, in a word, to have the character which MacDonald attributed to God and Chesterton following him to the critic, that of being easy to please but hard to satisfy. I was so happy to see this exact reference to our find at the Wade Center in Lewis's published work, when I discovered the connection in an experiment in criticism, I even scared my wife and kids with a howl of delight. Now, according to Charlie Starr's handwriting analysis, Lewis read and annotated Fancies versus Fads sometime between 1934 and 1939. This suggests that over 20 years had passed from the time Lewis first read Fancies to his including the easy-to-please art critic concept in his own work. An Experiment in Criticism was among the last of his books released while Lewis was alive. It was published in 1961, a mere two years before his death. And in the epilogue, Jack looks back on his life as a reader with more tenderness than one might expect to find in a critic. Those of us 
who have been true readers all our life, seldom fully realize the enormous extension of our being which we owe to authors. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet remain myself. Like the night sky in the Greek poem, I see through a myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action and in knowing, I transcend myself and am never more myself than when I do. In comparing the transcendent experience of reading with worship, Lewis has closed the loop. He has brought us back to the God who is pleased with our feeble, honest efforts to praise. So like Lewis, let us be free little children of the Father who celebrate our smallest steps of progress. Let us read on, worship, and love. Let us please God by our love for him and neighbor. Let us do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Let us practice pure religion by caring for widows and orphans and keeping ourselves unstained by the world. With all this, God will show himself as easy to please. And may we also believe in God's crucified and risen Son, receive his grace, and in so doing, mystically and miraculously see God do what is hard, satisfy himself. Chapter 5. Whose You Are The most practical and important thing about a man is still his view of the universe. G.K. Chesterton, Heretics. When I was growing up, my dad developed a practice of saying a certain phrase to me every time he dropped me off for school. We'd pull up near the building in a hand-me-down car gifted to us by one of his kind-hearted congregants, rusty and reeking of exhaust. I'd often sit slumped in the seat, hoping to avoid the eyes of my classmates. But when I'd finally get out of the car, and just before I'd shut the big squealing door, he'd say, remember who you are and whose you are. It was his way of reminding me that I had a family who loved me and that there were certain standards expected of me. He also meant to remind me that ultimately, I belonged to God. Every morning I left sobered and secure, knowing I wasn't alone. I was a Duncan, with all the benefits and responsibilities that came with that fact. And I was also part of a family that could inspire automotive charity. The summer after my senior year of high school, my dad and I visited the Republic of Ghana, West Africa. We were part of a team of Americans, dispatched from the church my dad was pastoring, who had come to work with local ministers in the hopes of planting new churches in the area. We were also there to help with general evangelism, speaking and preaching in some of the remote regions of the country. One large part of our gospel presentation included screening The Jesus Film, a Christian missions classic that has introduced millions of people around the world to Jesus since 1979. In fact, the movie has been translated into 1,600 languages and often gives viewers the chance to hear the story of Jesus in their own language for the first time. It was always exciting to see the screen go up in each village. With permission from the local chiefs, we would set up in a nearby field as curious kids laughed and played around us. Generators would hum, the projector would flicker to life, and as dusk turned to darkness, whole villages would gather at this cinema under the stars. All had worked smoothly until we came to the coastal city of Axim. If ever there was a night that things could go very badly, this seemed like the one. First of all, I was scheduled to speak after the film. I was just out of high school, not a lot of speaking experience. My nerves were palpable and paralyzing. Secondly, as we uncoiled our electrical cords and watched the sky, we couldn't help but notice that it looked like rain. Much like my dad on those early school mornings, God whispers through the natural world, remember who you are and whose you are. Paul writes in the first chapter of Romans that God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, 
have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. The natural world points to our Creator, but we don't need to look far to see that we manage to actively suppress the truth with our unrighteousness. We're tempted to worship created things over the Creator and often view the beauty of nature as a divine end in and of itself. And if not an end, certainly the most direct path to experiencing God or some vague sort of spirituality. C.S. Lewis warned us of the dangers of such thoughts. In the chapter titled, Likings and Loves for the Subhuman, in his work The Four Loves, he writes, The created glory may be expected to give us hints of the uncreated. For the one is derived from the other, and in some fashion reflects it. In some fashion but not perhaps in so direct and simple a fashion as we at first might suppose, we have seen an image of glory. We must not try to find a direct path through it and beyond it to an increasing knowledge of God. The path peters out almost at once. We can't get through not that way. We must make a detour, leave the hills and woods and go back to our studies to church, to our Bibles, to our knees. Otherwise, the love of nature is beginning to turn into a nature religion. And then, even if it does not lead us to the dark gods, it will lead us to a great deal of nonsense. So what nonsense is Lewis referring to, and where might our culture be bowing to dark gods today? Well, We see it when a Princeton professor like Peter Singer brazenly claims a newborn baby is of less value than a sentient pig, dog, or chimp. We see it when philosophers at Johns Hopkins University suggest having fewer children in an effort to ward off climate change. We see it when materialists seek to explain the existence of the universe with nothing but time, matter, and chance. Now, admittedly, No full Christian ethic disregards the proper respect and stewardship of the gift we call earth. Sadly, in some circles of Christianity, even this charge seems forgotten or is eyed with suspicion. But we also have to remember that to truly love something, we can't expect more of it than it was ever intended to give. On the coast of Axim grows a beautiful softwood tree. Its wide trunk and large branches stand tall between a football field and the sea. Since my time in Ghana, I've read that libation is poured out to a deity which is said to dwell in the tree. But while my father and I were there, we were told that the tree itself is worshipped. Silhouetted against the looming rain clouds, the tree certainly struck an imposing figure. It was magnificent and melancholy. The tree also represented a tangible reason we had come— Here was a chance to offer Christ to a pre-Christian people who, much like my own ancestors on the British Isles, found their religious impulse awakened by the natural world. This made me want more than ever to show our new friends the Jesus film, and it heightened my desire to deliver a coherent talk. But those clouds were thick, low, and gray-black against the purple sky, and we knew that the bottom could drop at any moment. So we stopped and prayed to God that a storm wouldn't short-circuit our chance to share. Then we finished setting up and started the film. We can't know for sure if Jack's reading of Gilbert directly stimulated his thoughts on nature while he wrote The Four Loves, but a Lewis diary entry shows that Chesterton had influenced him on the subject as far back as 1924. In that entry, dated Wednesday, March 5th, Lewis wrote, looked into Chesterton's life of St. Francis, the chapter about naturalism, and what it led to amongst pagans, which I thought pretty true, though whether Christianity made any immediate difference on the masses is not so clear. While Chesterton hadn't fully convinced the pre-converted Lewis of Christianity's impact, his point about the dangers of naturalism must have resonated. Chesterton wrote in part... The great guides and pioneers of pagan antiquity started out with the idea of something splendidly obvious and direct. The idea that if a man walked straight ahead on the high road of reason and nature, he would come to no harm, especially if he was, as the Greek was, 
eminently enlightened and intelligent. No sooner did the Greeks themselves begin to follow their own noses and their own notion of being natural than the queerest thing in history seems to have happened to them. The wisest men in the world set out to be natural, and the most unnatural thing in the world was the very first thing they did, the immediate effect of saluting the sun and the sunny sanity of nature was a perversion spreading like a pestilence. The greatest and even the purest philosophers could not apparently avoid this low sort of lunacy. Under the winged shadow of Eros, their deity of sensual desire, the ancient Greeks became saturated with graphic erotic art, prostitution, and even socially accepted pederasty, where boys as young as 12 entered into sexual relationships with much older men. The Greeks had tried to be natural, but ended up unnaturally fixated on sex. Chesterton went on. Nothing could purge this obsession but a religion that was literally unearthly. It was no good telling such people to have a natural religion full of stars and flowers. There was not a flower or even a star that had not been stained. It was no good to preach natural religion to people to whom nature had grown as unnatural as any religion. They knew much better than we do what was the matter with them and what sort of demons at once tempted and tormented them. And they wrote across that great space of history the text, This sort goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Such passages were not the last time Chesterton taught Lewis on this topic. Our findings at the Wade Center showed that Lewis was also impacted during his reading of Orthodoxy. That 1908 publication is one of Chesterton's most well-known works, so it was amazing to be able to hold the copy that C.S. Lewis owned. In the rear flyleaf verso of the little claret-colored hardback, Lewis created an extensive handmade index, much like he did in Fancies versus Fads. There he jotted 14 fragments of sentences and page numbers to remind himself where those thoughts appeared in the book. Charlie Starr's handwriting analysis dates those notes, characterized by lower left looping triangular Fs, to around 1934 to 1939, saying, I lean toward the earlier years, but that's only a subjective impression. This would place Lewis's reading of orthodoxy early in his Christian life. Among that long list in neat pencil, Lewis wrote, Nature is our sister, 205, to remind himself where he could find this famous Chesterton passage. Only the supernatural has taken a sane view of nature. The essence of all pantheism, evolutionism, and modern cosmic religion is really in this proposition that nature is our mother. Unfortunately, if you regard nature as a mother, you discover that she is a stepmother. The main point of Christianity was this, that nature is not our mother. Nature is our sister. We can be proud of her beauty since we have the same father but she has no authority over us. We have to admire, but not imitate. These words bear a striking resemblance to a paragraph in Lewis's own book, Miracles. Only supernaturalists rarely see nature. You must go a little away from her and then turn round and look back. Then at last the true landscape will have become visible. You must have tasted, however briefly, the pure water from beyond the world, before you can be distinctly conscious of the hot, salty tang of nature's current. To treat her as God, or as everything, is to lose the whole pith and pleasure of her. Come out, look back, and then you'll see. I mentioned we'd shown the Jesus film several times already on that mission trip to Ghana, but that night continued to feel different. There was, of course, my talk to consider, but there was also the threat of rain and that tree looming over us through it all. But there was something more. As the film unspooled, the good people of Axim seemed especially moved. They cheered as Jesus stilled the storm. They wept at his death on the cross. 
and they applauded his resurrection. In these moments, my nerves faded into the background. I had flown 15 hours bearing cables, cords, and screens. I was supposed to be the missionary, but my new friends were ministering to me. Their genuine reactions to seeing the story of Jesus in their language for the first time showed me how stale I had grown. I'd seen the film before. I knew how it ended. I'd heard the accounts of Christ so many times that I had let them become familiar. I'd read the Gospels in such a way that they'd become mere words on a page. But here were people seeing Jesus with fresh eyes. When my time came to speak, all I had to do was confess that we could know the God who healed the sick and halted the storm. We could know the God who has power over nature. Indeed, His Spirit was with us even then, holding back the rain long enough for His children to finish the film. The people of Axim had been right to be awed by that softwood from their ancient days. It is magnificent, and it does reflect its Maker. Like all humanity, they had drifted into worshiping and serving creation instead of the Creator. But under those stopped-up clouds, many of the people of Axim accepted with joy the One who made us all. They believed freely in the Christ on the cross, God pouring out His own libation on their behalf, in part perhaps because they'd always expected to find deity in a tree. Both Chesterton and Lewis echoed the truth that has been sounding over this good earth since the garden. We are all part of the amazing and diverse human family, and there are certain standards expected of us. We are each unique creations, with all the benefits and responsibilities that come with that fact. We belong to God. We can be sober and secure, knowing that we aren't alone. So while we do have a beautiful sister, ultimately, it is our brother, born under the star, stilling the storm, lifted on twisted branches, then walking from a cave and into the rising sun who points us to our Father, rushing to meet us with open arms. Chapter 6 Appetite of Infancy Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. When the author of the Chronicles of Narnia writes an essay titled On Three Ways of Writing for Children, you read it multiple times, you circle words. You underline sentences. In the piece, C.S. Lewis defends fairy tales as kindlers of spiritual longing. He praises Tolkien's work on the subject and reminds us to respect children because we have it on, quote, high authority that in the moral sphere they are probably at least as wise as we. It's got all the wit, wisdom, and humility that are hallmarks of Lewis's work. The essay actually began its life as a talk to the Library Association in 1952 before finding its way to publication in a collection of Lewis's work titled Of Other Worlds, Essays and Stories. I would have loved to hear him deliver his remarks in person that day, but I'm certainly grateful to at least have them preserved in writing. In one of the most memorable parts of the speech, Lewis cautions us against an obsession with attaining adulthood. Critics who treat adult as a term of approval instead of as a merely descriptive term cannot be adult themselves. To be concerned about being grown up, to admire the grown up because it is grown up, to blush at the suspicion of being childish, these things are the marks of childhood and adolescence. And in childhood and adolescence they are, in moderation, healthy symptoms. Young things ought to want to grow. But to carry on into middle life or even into early manhood, this concern about being adult is a mark of really arrested development. When I was ten, I read fairy tales in secret and would have been ashamed if I had been found doing so. Now that I'm fifty, I read them openly. When I become a man, I put away childish things, including the fear of childishness and the desire to be very grown up I now enjoy Tolstoy and Jane Austen and Trollope, as well as fairy tales, and I call that growth.
Here, Lewis has presented us with a very Chestertonian paradox. The tension might be summed up like this. To truly grow, one must keep what is childlike, and to remain childlike, one must mature beyond fear. Jesus himself tells us, whoever humbles himself like this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Our acceptance of this teaching is vital to our spiritual health. In fact, Jesus reserves some of his most violent language for those who mistreat children, saying, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's Jesus talking. It can be safely said that Lewis practiced what Christ taught about respect for children and childlike humility. In addition to penning enduring works for young readers, he was also known to correspond with them by post, by mail, and he quietly donated large sums of his earnings to aid widows and orphans. This is the C.S. Lewis that loyal readers recognize, but it seems that it took a war and a certain little girl to help the British bachelor move in that direction. During the Second World War, Lewis opened his South Oxford home to children evacuating London as the Blitz, Germany's bombing attack, ravaged the city. If such a scene sounds familiar to readers of Narnia, it's because one of those evacuees, a young girl named June Fluitt, seems to have provided the basis for Lucy Pevensey. June, now Jill Freud after she married Sir Clement Freud, the grandson of Sigmund Freud, was told as much by Lewis's stepson, Douglas Gresham, in a letter stating, I suppose you know that you are the prototype for Lucy. Well, Jill, or June, lived on and off at the kilns for years with Lewis and his adoptive mother, Janie Moore. She helped out with their 20 hens, supped with Jack and his brother, and even took tea with Tolkien. Lewis then paid for her to go to the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. She graduated and went on to have a West End career under the name Jill Raymond. Over the years, Lewis and Jill developed such a relationship that Lewis wrote in a 1944 letter that Jill was the most selfless person he had ever known. On recalling her first encounter with the man, Jill said, Oh, I loved him. Loved him, of course I did. I was in the kitchen helping Mrs. Moore with the hen food when I first met him. I turned around and knew this was something momentous. Jack would go on to say, I never appreciated children till the war brought them to me. But if Jill was on Lewis's mind as he created Narnia, so too was his goddaughter, the child of his friend Owen Barfield. It is to this Lucy that Lewis wrote a beautiful letter that would become the dedication at the beginning of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. My dear Lucy, I wrote this story for you, but when I began it, I had not realized that girls grow quicker than books. As a result, you are already too old for fairy tales. And by the time it is printed and bound, you'll be older still. But someday, you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again. You can then take it down from some upper shelf, dust it, and tell me what you think of it. Your affectionate godfather, C.S. Lewis. His words seem to have been prophetic. Lucy Barfield did grow up. And in the midst of a promising career teaching music and dance, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. She continued battling for years, teaching between her bouts in the hospital, before finally entering one for good after the death of her husband. She would remain hospitalized for the last 13 years of her life, during the final five of those years, when she could no longer speak or feed herself. Lucy would love for her brother Jeffrey to take the Chronicles of Narnia down from some upper shelf and read it to her over and over and over again. But before Narnia and before the war brought children into his life, Lewis was reading orthodoxy. And he seems to have been impacted by a beautiful passage from G.K. Chesterton about the spiritual strength of youth. Here Lewis saw a picture of God from the mind of a man who was also known to correspond with children 
and even throw a good puppet show from time to time. It's one of my favorite parts of orthodoxy, so I was glad to learn that Lewis included it in the rather lengthy index at the back of his own copy. In that list, he wrote down the page number on which the quote appeared, 107, and the powerful final six words of the paragraph that we turn to now. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he's nearly dead. For grown-up people are not strong enough to exult in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never got tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Such a concept seems almost too fantastic. How can this be? How can we conceive of our eternally existing father as younger than us in any way? But if it is indeed true that our maturation requires maintaining a childlike nature, then we shouldn't be surprised to hear that God, the one who made time and is therefore not subject to it, has had his childlike nature all along. When my son Ethan was five years old, my son Caleb was nearly two years old. At that time, Caleb was making his voice heard in screeches and cries and sometimes words. Now, many times, my wife and I couldn't understand him, even though he expressed his feelings with passion. But while his mother and I may have struggled to understand some of Caleb's mushed mouth pronouncements, we discovered a lovely truth. Ethan was his brother's best interpreter. By a lot. He could instantly translate babble into helpful information. And sometimes I wondered if Ethan could understand his little brother best because he himself wasn't so far removed from those early childhood days of yearning and learning to talk. He hadn't lost the ability to speak the language that must be common to all children and to God. I pray he never does. On the day we see Jesus face to face, he will bear the marks of crucifixion. He will have nail prints in his hands and feet. His side will carry a scar from a Roman spear. We will see the mature body of someone who willingly tasted death and defeated it. We will see a man, the God-man. Jesus truly is, as the title of another Chesterton classic proclaims, the everlasting man. But even still, Every winter season finds us remembering a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Chesterton writes mysteriously of the immortal infancy of the Christ. Scripture and the creeds remind us that Jesus is also the eternally begotten Son of the Father. At least in that sense, our Master and Lord, the one we are to imitate, can also rightly be called the Everlasting Child. Chapter 7. Patriots? Patriotism has, then, many faces. C.S. Lewis, The Four Loves. Patriotism is fundamentally a conviction that a particular country is the best in the world because you were born in it. George Bernard Shaw published this caustic thought in The World on November 15, 1893. Shaw would later double down on that belief by placing the line... You'll never have a quiet world till you knock the patriotism out of the human race, on the lips of a character from one of his one-act plays. Shaw is also credited with the quote, Patriotism is a pernicious, psychopathic form of idiocy. Such sentiments, among others, kept Shaw at continual, though good-natured odds with G.K. Chesterton throughout their literary lives, 
As leading writers and thinkers of their time, Shaw and Chesterton shared a friendship and the debate stage. One famous interchange between them began when Chesterton quipped to his slender enemy, I see there has been a famine in the land, to which Shaw shot back at his portly opponent, and I see the cause of it. Weight jokes aside, the two men really did have drastically different worldviews. They disagreed on such wide-ranging topics as private property, paradoxes, and polygamy. Chesterton was, of course, a Christian, and later specifically Catholic. Shaw was a self-described mystic who rejected all formal religion. George Bernard Shaw never stopped writing, speaking, or working toward what he thought would make for a better society. But G.K. Chesterton always felt that there was something faulty in his friend's philosophy. Chesterton thought Shaw's longing for a superior humanity often caused a contempt that kept him from seeing real people with the proper amount of wonder. And so as early as 1905, Chesterton dedicated a chapter in Heretics to his friendly foe. He wrote, Mr. Shaw has never seen things as they really are. If he had, he would have fallen on his knees before them. He has always had a secret ideal that has withered all the things of this world. He has all the time been silently comparing humanity with something that was not human, with a monster from Mars, with a wise man of the Stoics, with the economic man of the Fabians, with Julius Caesar, with Siegfried, with the Superman. Mr. Shaw asks not for a new kind of philosophy, but for a new kind of man. Mr. Shaw cannot understand that the thing which is valuable and lovable in our eyes is man. The old beer-drinking, creed-making, fighting, failing, sensual, respectable man. It seems that in asking us not to be better, but more than human, Shaw inadvertently rendered us less in his own eyes And in 1909, Chesterton dedicated an entire book to what he saw as Shaw's faulty thoughts. C.S. Lewis owned that book, and on page 188 in his copy of George Bernard Shaw, there is a penciled checkmark in the margin next to the following underlined sentence. The same is true of Mr. Shaw's refusal to understand the love of the land, either in the form of patriotism or in private ownership. The sentence comes in the context of Chesterton's overall analysis that Shaw is wrong about nearly all the things one learns early in life and while one is still simple. It should be mentioned that Shaw disagreed with Chesterton's characterization of him in the book that bore his name. But Shaw was indeed a socialist, and his published position on patriotism preceded him. So Chesterton's critique on this point at least seems accurate. Now, it must be admitted here that a single checkmark and an underline is not as feasible to authenticate as actual lettering. But that being said, it is significant that the book is part of the C.S. Lewis Library at the Wade Center, and we also found a Lewis diary entry from Thursday, July 1st, 1926, confirming that he was reading the book George Bernard Shaw on that day. For those that might be unconvinced that the underline is from Lewis's own hand, there is another completely separate notation on patriotism in Lewis's collection as well. In the index at the back of Orthodoxy, Lewis jotted, The Literary Men Outside All Literature, 174, to remind himself of the portion and page number he wanted to recall. The full passage is in the chapter, The Paradoxes of Christianity, and it is tucked in a section where Chesterton is critiquing those who want to feel everything freely, so they even break away from the ordinary limits of home. Chesterton writes, Mental and emotional liberty are not so simple as they look. Really, they require almost as careful a balance of laws and conditions as do social and political liberty. The ordinary aesthetic anarchist who sets out to feel everything freely gets knotted at last in a paradox that prevents him feeling at all. He breaks away from home limits to follow poetry, but in ceasing to feel home limits, he has ceased to feel the odyssey. He is free from national prejudices and outside patriotism, but being outside patriotism, he is outside Henry V. Such a literary man is simply outside all literature. 
he is more of a prisoner than any bigot. For if there is a wall between you and the world, it makes little difference whether you describe yourself as locked in or as locked out. What we want is not the universality that is outside all normal sentiments. We want the universality that is inside all normal sentiments. Here we have a first-hand account of Jack thinking through the subject of patriotism with Gilbert for his guide as early as 1934. Not quite a decade later, Lewis would take up the subject and introduce us to two men who had locked themselves outside of literature and were apparently attempting to bolt the door behind others as well. In February of 1943, C.S. Lewis gave a series of lectures that would become his book, The Abolition of Man. In the first chapter, Men Without Chests, Lewis takes aim at an English textbook meant for, quote, boys and girls in the upper forms of schools, end quote. He charitably changed the name of the text to The Green Book and changed the names of the authors before proceeding to unmask the callow and dangerous philosophy of these literary men. One part of the textbook that particularly piqued Lewis was the author's inclusion of a cheesy pleasure cruise ad that promised passengers golden hours, glowing colors, and a voyage across the western ocean where Drake of Devon sailed. The writers of the textbook presented the ad as something to be wary of. Students would have gathered that they should not write that way, nor should they fall prey to such sentiments. Lewis admits that the text mentioned is misleading and does exploit the natural emotions that are evoked when we dream of traveling to historic places. The Green Book's authors would have been right to condemn the advertisement based on its poor prose, but instead they pointed out that it was metaphorical and the crews couldn't really provide the inspiring experience that the ad had promised. Lewis feared that by failing to contrast the obviously florid advertisement against examples of quality writing from authors like Samuel Johnson and William Wordsworth, who also sought to stir patriotic emotions, the writers of the Green Book were subtly teaching young readers this. That all emotions aroused by local association are in themselves contrary to reason and contemptible. The schoolboy is encouraged to reject the lure of the Western Ocean on the very dangerous ground that in doing he will prove himself a knowing fellow who can't be bubbled out of his cash. Gaius and Titius, while teaching him nothing about letters, have cut out of his soul long before he's old enough to choose the possibility of having certain experiences which thinkers of more authority than they have held to be generous, fruitful, and humane. Lewis would again bring his own clear voice to the subject of patriotism in his 1960 book, The Four Loves. In the chapter titled, Likings and Loves for the Subhuman, Lewis treats us to a masterful discussion on the love of the land that has Chesterton's fingerprints all over it. He presents a hearty, healthy view of patriotism, complete with all the warranted warnings about love of country not supplanting our love for God. He also encourages readers to remember historic atrocities committed under the guise of what he calls white man's burden, and to recall even the great deeds of a nation's past with sober minds. But even with all those warnings, Lewis landed in a different place than Shaw did on the subject of patriotism. Though he doesn't mention Shaw by name here, Lewis rejected his notion that the definition of patriotism must include the belief that one's country is superior to all others. Like Chesterton, he saw room for a purer form of patriotism. Lewis simply calls this love of home, with all of its familiar sights, sounds, and smells. In one key paragraph, he extols his own British way of life, and even includes a paraphrase from Chesterton's The Everlasting Man that is just wrong enough to suggest it was from memory. With this love for the place, there goes a love for the way of life, for beer and tea and open fires, trains with compartments in them and an unarmed police force, and all the rest of it for the local dialect and a shade less for our native language. As Chesterton says... A man's reasons for not wanting his country to be ruled by foreigners are very like his reasons for not wanting his house to be burned down, because he could not even begin to enumerate all the things he would miss. I myself love the verdant nature preserve, 
quaint neighborhoods, changing seasons, and the thriving restaurant sport and music scenes of my Midwestern city. Substitute your own indigenous examples into Lewis's list and try not to smile or cry. This local affection is natural, and Lewis argued it can actually point us toward loving the wider world. He continued, It would be hard to find any legitimate point of view from which this feeling could be condemned, as the family offers us the first step beyond self-love, so this offers us the first step beyond family selfishness. In any mind which has a pennyworth of imagination, it produces a good attitude toward foreigners. How can I love my home without coming to realize that other men no less rightly love theirs? The last thing we want is to make everywhere else just like our own home. It would not be home unless it were different. Surely Shaw had encountered such thoughts, but I can't help dreaming that Gilbert, Jack, and George Bernard Shaw could have gathered at an English inn for some sort of drinks, Shaw avoided beer, and debate. Perhaps the rollicking journalist and the Oxford academic could have prevailed upon the playwright with their powers combined. Perhaps Lewis would have mentioned, as he does in The Four Loves, that those who disapprove of patriotism have to reject half the high poetry and half the heroic action our race has achieved. We cannot keep even Christ's lament over Jerusalem. He too exhibits love for his country. See, a superman of sorts had already come, and neither Nietzsche nor Shaw needed to look for another. The one who was fully God and fully man walked the earth as one more human than Shaw would have allowed and more divine than Nietzsche could have possibly imagined. Lewis wrote, a man who really loves his country will love her in ruin and degeneration. And as the Son of Man entered Jerusalem with Hosanna still ringing in his ears, even he wept over the rebellious city he loved and longed to hold as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. But Luke's gospel also tells us that Christ then entered the temple, filled with righteous rage. His love doesn't restrain his rebukes, but spurs them. Tables turned over, crooked money changers driven from their cheating, the place of prayer protected, all in the court of the Gentiles. And this point seems significant for our discussion. Jesus wants Gentiles, as well as Jews, to know that the path of prayer to the Father must stay unobstructed. Christ removes unjust barriers. And as the shepherd who has other sheep that are not of the Jewish fold, Jesus invites everyone to have fair entry into his Father's house with all its familiar sights, sounds, and smells. We don't need to hate another country to love our own, or to hate our own to love another. Even when love restricts, it doesn't constrict. Love expands. Chapter 8. The Binding Bet of Marriage Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them, male and female, and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus, Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. My father defeated me in every single game of one-on-one -on -one pickup basketball we played while I was growing up. Every game. He shamelessly employed his size and height advantage and also wasn't shy about celebrating his victories. Few things have enraged me as deeply as taking those losses. I realized only years later that the gravel driveway on which we played favored his post-up game far more than it did my reliance on the dribble drive. Over the years... I've wondered why he never let me win. But reflecting on it now, I know I wouldn't have wanted him to. A fake victory is a hollow one, and a game isn't very exciting if there are no stakes. Chesterton would agree with me. And I know that because of something he wrote in The Eternal Revolution, the seventh chapter of Orthodoxy. In confronting the popular utopian philosophy of his day, Chesterton began an intriguing line of reasoning. He wrote, 
paradoxically, of course, about how losing the freedom to make a pledge or bind oneself actually fetters any fun. He said this. I could never conceive or tolerate any utopia which did not leave me the liberty for which I chiefly care, the liberty to bind myself. Complete anarchy would not merely make it impossible to have any discipline or fidelity. It would also make it impossible to have any fun. <laughs> to, to take an obvious instance, it would not be worthwhile to bet if a bet was not binding. The dissolution of all contracts would not only ruin morality, but spoil sport. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? When my father and I took to the backyard hoop, we kept score. We knew one of us would emerge the victor and the other would taste defeat. But even knowing this outcome, we played. And maybe even because of it. So much of our popular entertainment highlights this impulse as well. More people watch sports when the playoffs start. Contestants on our game shows are often asked to risk all their winnings for a chance at a bigger payoff. And several shows now place actual business owners before real investors. We can't get enough of it. The movies we watch, the seasons we binge, and the books we read must put our protagonists in peril. Chesterton noted this elsewhere in Orthodoxy. In a, a thrilling novel, that purely Christian product, the hero is not eaten by cannibals, but it is essential to the existence of the thrill that he might be eaten by cannibals. The hero must, so to speak, be an edible hero. <laughs> Are we simply a society of masochists? Chesterton wouldn't say so, at least not because of that. He saw our pull towards real potential consequences as attempts to fulfill our natural longings for adventure and romance. For Chesterton, no earthly endeavor embodied that spirit of adventure and romance better than marriage. He saw marriage as a sacred union that truly provides the riches of risk and reward that we long for. But this wasn't just a theory for Gilbert. Marriage was an adventure he had the privilege to live, and it affected him deeply. After Francis Blogg, under the summer sun of 1898, accepted his proposal to marry him, Chesterton wrote her a letter that very same evening. I never knew what being happy meant before tonight. Happiness is not at all smug. It is not peaceful or contented as I have always been till today. Happiness brings not peace but a sword. It shakes you like rattling dice. It breaks your speech and darkens your sight. Happiness is stronger than oneself and sets its palpable foot upon one's neck. Ten years later, Gilbert still must have been rattled by the great gravity of his marriage vows because he wrote this in Orthodoxy. If I bet, I, I must be made to pay, or there is no poetry in betting. If I challenge, I must be made to fight, or there is no poetry in challenging. If I vow to be faithful, I must be cursed when I am unfaithful, or there is no fun in vowing. For the purpose even of the wildest romance, results must be real. Results must be irrevocable. Christian marriage is the great example of a real and irrevocable result. And that is why it is the chief subject and center of all our romantic writing. And after reading that passage, C.S. Lewis wrote, Marriage as a Bet, 226, in that large index at the back of his copy of Orthodoxy. Again, Charlie Starr's handwriting analysis indicates that those notes were written during the mid to late 1930s. That means Lewis was meditating on the magnitude of marriage some 20 years before he rolled the dice himself and was joined to the ailing Joy Davidman in Christian marriage beside her hospital bed on March 21, 1957. In many ways, marriage really is a high-stakes bet. We've no guarantee how the dice will land, and we can't see all the cards the other player might be holding. The one certainty we do have, expressly stated at the start, is that even if every other pitfall is prevented, death will part the pair. One doesn't have to marry a woman bravely battling cancer to know that truth. <laughs>
except for those rare, tragic cases when both spouses die at the same moment, one will leave the other alone. And Joy did leave Lewis on July 13, 1960, prompting him to write his haunting work, A Grief Observed. In that book, which was originally written as journal entries and published under the pseudonym N.W. Clerk, Lewis wrote candidly about his pain and the silence that he sensed from God. The pages ring with the dissonance of a brilliant mind trying to think clearly with a broken heart. He tries to reason. He dispenses with platitudes. He cuts himself very little slack, and God even less. It's a tough read for anyone who has come to love Lewis through his writing, and one longs for the parts of the book where hope breaks through. One such portion does arise when Lewis begins to consider the inevitability of a spouse's death in a new way. For all pairs of lovers without exception, bereavement is a universal and integral part of our experience of love. It follows marriage as normally as marriage follows courtship or as autumn follows summer. It is not a truncation of the process, but one of its phases, not the interruption of the dance, but the next figure. We are taken out of ourselves by the loved one while she is here. Then comes the tragic figure of the dance in which we must learn to be still taken out of ourselves though the bodily presence is withdrawn, to love the very her and not fall back to loving our past or our memory or our sorrow or our relief from sorrow or our own love. It's a beautiful passage, but it does need a couple of qualifications in the context of our discussion. First, we know that death is a product of the fall and is therefore more sinister than the changing of the seasons. However, God has been known to use death for his good purposes, so Lewis's thoughts about learning to love the very her seem sound. Secondly, it's worth noting that most Christian marriage vows contain the phrase, till death do us part. And many people do go on to another happy marriage after a spouse dies. That and the fact that our Lord tells us we are not given in marriage in heaven should inoculate us from interpreting Lewis's words to mean that the remaining party must keep dancing with the dead for all eternity. But even with those qualifications taken into consideration, it seems that the sanctity of Lewis's binding marriage vows actually gave him meaning when he desperately needed it. By learning to love his bride more deeply in death and trying to waltz with dignity through their final figure, Lewis found a purpose in his pain. By seeing his present state as an unavoidable stage of matrimony in a fallen world, Lewis was allowed space to keep working on his marriage as he grieved. Learning to love Joy didn't have to stop just because she was gone. The terms of the bet may end at death, but that doesn't mean the romance and adventure have to. If, as Chesterton says, Christian marriage is the central theme in our romantic literature, is it any wonder that Scripture is also stippled with curious and beautiful references to Jesus as the bridegroom? In the Gospels, Christ himself uses such language. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul instructs husbands to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And in Revelation, the apostle of love sees a vision of the new Jerusalem descending from heaven adorned like a bride. God's story is the ultimate adventure, the first and final romance. In fact, if marriage is a bet, our Lord might well be called the great gambler. For he left his father, traveled to a hostile land, faced death in every hound of hell to win his bride for eternity. Chapter 9. Modern Day Madmen. I take a very low view of climates of opinion. 
In his own subject, every man knows that all discoveries are made and all errors corrected by those who ignore the climate of opinion. C.S. Lewis, The Problem of Pain. Under the watch of an ocular sun, blue workers bend in fields dancing like flames on the bank of a shining river. This striking scene greets viewers in a painting called The Red Vineyard. With its oils piled high, this work resides at the Pushkin Museum of Fine Arts, Moscow. It is believed by many to be the only painting Vincent van Gogh officially sold during his life. Today, for better or worse, Van Gogh's works are as ubiquitous as refrigerator magnets and coffee mugs. But even in the face of such pervasive commercialism, Van Gogh is considered a prolific and visionary genius in serious artistic circles as well. This was not the case during the Dutchman's brief life. Vincent Van Gogh is one of the most tragic and dramatic examples of the public not appreciating what they had until time and perspective whittled the edges of their codified culture. When Vincent attended Antwerp Academy in Belgium, the academic director, upon seeing his work, said, I won't correct such putrefied dogs, and kicked him out of class. Later, in a letter to a former classmate, Vincent wrote about his problems selling paintings in Paris. He said, trade is slow here. The great dealers sell masters at exorbitant prices. They do little or nothing for young artists. The second-class dealers sell those at very low prices. If I asked more, I would do nothing, I fancy. However, I have faith in color. Even with regards, the price the public will pay for it in the long run. But for the present, things are awfully hard. He would, of course, be proven right about the public. The world has been won by the way Vincent van Gogh played with pigments. He studied the masters. Fellow Dutchman Rembrandt was a personal favorite. He was also influenced by the contemporary French avant-garde. But Vincent didn't cave to the current conventions. Instead, he worked to develop his unique, beloved, and instantly recognizable style. Today, many of Van Gogh's works are among the most expensive paintings ever sold. When he was alive, Vincent struggled to buy paint. Herman Melville's Moby Dick is considered one of the great American novels, but it wasn't a success upon its release, either critically or financially. Melville's lifetime earnings from the book totaled $556.37. When Melville died in 1891, he was a virtually unknown writer. The people of New York didn't know it, but one of the world's literary geniuses worked as a customs inspector in their city for nearly 20 years to make ends meet. Melville's work was rediscovered in the 1920s and finally received appreciation. Artists who are truly ahead of their time always run the risk of dying before their culture catches up to them. Or in many cases, only when their culture catches them. If this is true, it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus, the supreme artist, the author and finisher of our faith, died a lonely criminal's death. Some might question the depiction of Jesus as an artist. After all, we don't know of anything Jesus himself ever wrote. We certainly don't have anything he ever painted or sketched. We don't even know of any surviving constructions from his days as a tradesman, but Jesus of Nazareth was most assuredly an artist. His very life was art, and it flowed from him like living water. It seems to me that only a true dramatist would approach a boat in the dead of night walking on the water, or wait until his friend had died only to raise him to life before a weeping crowd, only an orator of the highest order could tell stories that were instantly relatable to a largely uneducated audience and yet still have those same parables bear the weight of two millennia of scholarly scrutiny. He turned the side of a mountain into the side of the most famous sermon ever preached, and he gave us the most memorable prayer in history, almost as an aside, a mere example. Jesus was so far ahead of his time because he was before it, and he was outside of it. Christ clashed with the culture and was killed by the political and religious powers of his day. Certainly no one in first century Jerusalem, and certainly not his own followers, expected Jesus' ministry to continue after his death. That's because even though he had promised it, though the Hebrew scriptures had predicted it, no one was expecting the resurrection. But even after such a miracle, it would have been hard to fathom how far his message would reach. After all, 
even at his ascension, yet another instance of high drama, our Lord only appeared to 500 people, many of them doubting him even then. How could anyone have foreseen that 2,000 years later the faith that bears Christ's name would boast a global following of over 2 billion adherents? The mustard seed truly did flourish into a tree with ample branches for the birds of the air to nest in, proving the zeitgeist is no match for the paraclete. In his copy of Chesterton's Orthodoxy, C.S. Lewis wrote this phrase for reference in his index in the back. It is always easy to be a modernist, 184. Flipping to the page mentioned, we find Chesterton in the chapter, The Paradoxes of Christianity, upending long-accepted, though stale, thoughts about the Christian faith. Even in 1908, it was already common to consider Christian orthodoxy dull and domesticated. To many, it seemed tame and safe. But Gilbert begged to differ, instead focusing his reader's attention on what he called the thrilling romance of orthodoxy. To him, adhering to the long-held truths and traditions of Christianity was downright dangerous. Holding to a faith passed down through the centuries by apostles, prophets, and peasants was pure exhilaration. For Chesterton, orthodoxy was like unfurling a flag of defiant, dramatic sanity in the face of a world gone mad. There had been plenty of chances for the church to succumb to the spirit of the age, but through all the years there was always a remnant, always orthodoxy. He wrote this. The Orthodox Church never took the tame course or accepted the conventions. The Orthodox Church was never respectable. It is easy to be a madman. It is easy to be a heretic. It is always easy to let the age have its head. The difficult thing is to keep one's own. It is always easy to be a modernist, as it is easy to be a snob, to have fallen into any of these open traps of error and exaggeration which fashion after fashion and sect after sect set along the historic path of Christendom. That would indeed have been simple. It is always simple to fall. There are an infinity of angles at which one falls, and only one at which one stands. To have fallen into any of the fads, from Gnosticism to Christian science, would indeed have been obvious and tame. But to have avoided them all has been one whirling adventure, and in my vision, the heavenly chariot flies thundering through the ages, the dull heresies sprawling and prostrate, the wild truth reeling but erect. Chesterton was, in many ways, a perfect vessel to deliver this message. Yes, he was popular in his own time. Of course he was published. He was certainly read. But he was also caricatured and often gawked at as an anachronism with a sword stick and a sagging hat. Yes, Gilbert was loved, but he was never a man of his time. No anecdote illustrates this fact more clearly than one he shared in his autobiography. Chesterton was once seated by a Cambridge academic at a dinner party. The man couldn't help himself and asked Chesterton if he really believed the faith he defended in debates. The man must have figured that his companion's work was a shtick, a journalistic trick. It may have been easier in that moment for Gilbert to concede he was indeed a modernist masquerading as a monk. But Chesterton couldn't lie. He assured the man he was a true believer, and they both returned to their meals. G.K. Chesterton's work has stood the test of time, in part because he knew that true advancements, at least in human terms, don't spring to life ex nihilo but are built on the best of what's come before. This fact alone should be enough to keep us humble, even as improvements are made. As Chesterton memorably wrote elsewhere in Orthodoxy, Tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. It is the democracy of the dead. Tradition refuses to submit to the small and arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking about. The artists, the thinkers, the inventors, and the entrepreneurs who accept that timeless principle and incorporate it into their work are actually best at gaining what might be called 
the populism of the preborn. C.S. Lewis, like Chesterton, is an excellent example of this, and he wrote specifically against what he came to call chronological snobbery. In Surprised by Joy, he credits his friend and fellow inkling, Owen Barfield, for breaking him of the conceit he defines as this. The uncritical acceptance of the intellectual climate common to our own age and the assumption that whatever has gone out of date is on that account discredited. You must find why it went out of date. Was it ever refuted, and if so, by whom, where, and how conclusively? Or did it merely die away, as fashions do? If the latter, this tells us nothing about its truth or falsehood. From seeing this, one passes to the realisation that our own age is also a period, and certainly has, like all periods, its own characteristic illusions. They are likeliest to lurk in those widespread assumptions which are so ingrained in the age that no one dares to attack or feels it necessary to defend them. Lewis felt so strongly that each age is blind to its own flaws that he even saw such deception as a direct demonic attack in his satiric The Screwtape Letters, the demon Screwtape tells his nephew Wormwood how evil spirits can exploit our disdain for the, quote, same old thing. He says this. The use of fashions in thought is to distract the attention of men from their real dangers. We direct the fashionable outcry of each generation against those vices of which it is least in danger and fix its approval on the virtue nearest to that vice which we are trying to make endemic. The game is to have them all running about with fire extinguishers whenever there is a flood and all crowding to that side of the boat which is already nearly gunwale under. Thus we make it fashionable to expose the dangers of enthusiasm. At the very moment when we are really making them all Byronic and drunk with emotion, the fashionable outcry is directed against the dangers of the mere understanding. Cruel ages are put on their guard against sentimentality, feckless and idle ones against respectability, lecherous ones against Puritanism. And whenever all men are really hastening to be slaves or tyrants, we make liberalism the prime bogey. Current thought trends are often extreme reactions to a previous era's unbalanced beliefs, which makes one wonder, where is our current Western culture crooked? Where will future generations look on us with horror, pity, and derision if we don't find our way to the truth? Will future generations notice our current tendency to be open to any other belief but our own ancient creeds and culture? Will they ask why America persisted in propping up a two-party political system that proved tone-deaf to the people? Might they also wonder why the most technologically advanced society in human history has struggled so deeply with rising healthcare costs? Might they ask why that same technologically advanced civilization can hear the fetal heartbeat, identify its unique DNA, peer into the womb with three-dimensional ultrasounds, and still abort over 600,000 children a year? Might they be shocked to learn that the batteries that power our phones are born on the back of child labor? And might they observe with concern, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that Sunday morning is still our most segregated hour of Christian America? Those issues and many more are much easier to ignore and accept as inevitable if we each remain in our own carefully cultivated communities. Is it possible that the climate of opinion one must guard most carefully against isn't just a general spirit of the age, but instead the sentiments of our closest associates? What do we lose when we surround ourselves only with like-minded people, when we choose our own climate and form our own cliques? G.K. Chesterton wrote in Heretics that the men of the clique live together because they have the same kind of soul and their narrowness is a narrowness of spiritual coherence and contentment like that which exists in hell. We see this phenomenon in businesses, school boards, media conglomerates, and most sadly in our churches. Might our congregations be healthier if we enriched ourselves with more humility and engaged ourselves with more humanity, 
churches that preach an anything-goes spirituality might reacquaint themselves with the catechism, while those who have their dogmas down may recall the sweet scent of grace. It's so very difficult for us to see beyond ourselves and those like us. Chesterton contrasts the constriction of the clique with the broader camaraderie of what he calls the clan. The man who lives in a small community, i.e. a clan, lives in a much larger world. He knows much more of the fierce varieties and uncompromising divergences of men. The reason is obvious. In a large community, we can choose our companions. In a small community, our companions are chosen for us. In such a culture, the youngest members learn from their elders how to avoid the pitfalls of the past. And the elders esteem the youth as they watch them walk the same paths they did before. In a true clan, children become parents, parents become grandparents, and all are respected. If we embrace the often ignored diversities of age and thought, then iron will sharpen iron again and again. History will be taught and new ideas will be born. The fire of culture will be stoked, preserved, and passed on. Some things never go out of fashion because they were never in fashion. In fact, they were never fashions at all. They were simply true, noble, pure, and lovely. The works of Gilbert and Jack meet this standard. Both men forged their own unique voices while also drawing from timeless sources like Dante and Dickens, Shakespeare and Scripture. Their work is timeless because they point to the one who is beyond time. Chapter 10. Jokes as well as justice. A characteristic of the great saints is their power of levity. G.K. Chesterton, Orthodoxy. G.K. Chesterton once said, in reference to his great size, I enjoy myself more than other men because there is such a lot of me having a good time. (laughs) There may have been a lot to Gilbert, but he never seemed to make too much of himself. He wasn't too big to have a bit of fun at his own expense, and even cackled at wisecracks hurled at him by debate opponents. English playwright and novelist Cosmo Hamilton wrote about his time sparring with G.K.C., He said, To hear Chesterton's howl of joy, to see him double himself up in an agony of laughter at my personal insults, to watch the effect of his sportsmanship on a shocked audience who were won to mirth by his intense and peahen-like quarks of joy was a sight and a sound for the gods. Hamilton lost their debate by inadvertently hurling himself off the sheer towering cliff of Chesterton's affable self-confidence. In a world where people fight to be taken seriously, the one who can take a joke wins the day. As he was no doubt absorbing jokes about his size, Chesterton was proving to all that the bigger man was also able to take himself more lightly. This mindset would help Chesterton in another debate, this one with Clarence Darrow of Scope's Monkey Trial and Inherit the Wind fame. Writing about the 1930 Chesterton vs. Darrow debate in The Nation, American journalist Henry Hazlitt said this, Mr. Chesterton's argument was like Mr. Chesterton, amiable, courteous, jolly. It was always clever, it was full of nice turns of expression, and altogether a very adroit exhibition by one of the world's ablest intellectual fencing masters and one of its most charming gentlemen. Mr. Darrow's personality, by contrast, seemed rather colorless and certainly very dour. His attitude seemed almost surly. He slurred his words. The rise and fall of his voice was sometimes heavily melodramatic, and his argument was conducted on an amazingly low intellectual level. Darrow himself would later say of Gilbert, I was favorably impressed by, warmly attached to, G.K. Chesterton. I enjoyed my debates with him and found him a man of culture and fine sensibilities. But Chesterton's deportment wasn't just a fortunate character quirk that helped him win debates. Chesterton's levity was birthed from the fabric of his Christian faith. He wrote this in Orthodoxy. Angels can fly because they can take themselves lightly. This has been always the instinct of Christendom, and especially the instinct of Christian art— (laughs) 
uh, in the old Christian pictures, the sky over every figure is like a blue or gold parachute. Every figure seems ready to fly up and float about in the heavens. The tattered cloak of the beggar will bear him up like the rayed plumes of the angels. But the kings in their heavy gold and the proud in their robes of purple will all of their nature sink downwards. For pride cannot rise to levity or levitation. Pride is the downward drag of all things into an easy solemnity. One settles down in, into a sort of selfish seriousness, but one has to rise to a gay self-forgetfulness. A man falls into a brown study. He reaches up at a blue sky. Seriousness is not a virtue. It would be a heresy, but a much more sensible heresy, to say that seriousness is a vice. It is really a, a natural trend or lapse into taking oneself gravely, because it is the easiest thing to do. It is much easier to write a good Times leading article than a good joke in Punch, for solemnity flows out of men naturally. But laughter is, is a leap. It is easy to be heavy, hard to be light. Satan fell by the force of gravity. During C.S. Lewis' reading of Orthodoxy in the 1930s, he made note of the previous passage in the rear flyleaf verso, writing simply, Satan fell by the force of gravity, 222. No doubt the sentiment resonated with the soul of Lewis. Like Chesterton before him, Lewis affirmed and practiced a lighter approach to life. A lovely example of this can be found in a 1957 letter to a young reader fittingly named Lucy. Lewis wrote sympathetically, I'm also bad at maths, and it is a continual nuisance to me. I get muddled over my change in shops. I hope you'll have better luck and get over the difficulty. It makes life a lot easier. But even such playful self-deprecation is just a snowflake on the iceberg of all his humble correspondence to children. For several decades, Lewis wrote hundreds of letters to little readers. In these, he sketched pictures, gave impromptu writing lessons, and patiently answered the same questions about Narnia time and time and time again. The mere fact that such a prominent lecturer, critic, broadcaster, and author wrote so diligently to children might be the finest example of his buoyant humility. Readers only know of these letters at all because they were compiled and published years later after his death in the collected letters of C.S. Lewis and in the lovely little volume C.S. Lewis's Letters to Children. Though that private correspondence provides perhaps the best example of Lewis taking himself lightly, he also addressed the theme directly throughout his most famous work. The White Witch in Narnia has a face that is, quote, proud and cold and stern and is set on enveloping Narnia with a joyless snow so that it's always winter and never Christmas. The witch also had a penchant for punishment that rendered her enemies mute monuments, strangling their very voices, and therefore any laughter from their throats. Aslan, however, is the happy creator who made the world for merriment. In The Magician's Nephew, Aslan breathed on some of his creatures and with a flash like fire gave them the power to speak. Creatures. I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give to you forever this land of Narnia. I give you the woods, the fruits, the rivers. I give you the stars, and I give you myself. Laugh and fear not, now that you're no longer dull and witless. You need not always be grave, for jokes as well as justice come in with speech. Years after the Narnian books had been published, Lewis continued to reflect upon the theme of levity. In 1961, he penned a preface to the paperback edition of the Screwtape Letters. Tucked inside this preface, we find a rare instance in which Lewis actually quotes directly the Chesterton line he had noted 20 years before while reading Orthodoxy. In the preface, Lewis mentions taking issue with the way German writer Johann Wolfgang von Goethe depicted the devil in his famous work Faust. Goethe's Mephistopheles, the demonic figure in German folklore, appears as civilized, sensible, and adaptable. 
Lewis saw this portrayal as something that has helped to strengthen the illusion that evil is liberating. It was a mistake Lewis was determined not to make when he deigned to depict the demonic. I was determined that my own symbolism should at least not err in Goethe's way. For humor involves a sense of proportion and a power of seeing yourself from the outside. Whatever else we attribute to beings who sin through pride, we must not attribute this. Satan, said Chesterton, fell through force of gravity. We must picture hell as a state where everyone is perpetually concerned about his own dignity and advancement, where everyone has a grievance, and where everyone lives the deadly serious passions of envy, self-importance, and resentment. If we allow ourselves to imagine that Lewis read orthodoxy toward the end of Charlie Starr's dating spectrum, even though he says he leans toward an earlier date, it would mean that Lewis could have read it in 1939. That would put his reading only two years before the first devilish letter appeared in serialized form in The Guardian on May 2, 1941, and only a year before the general idea for screw tape struck Lewis during a particularly boring church service. All this, combined with the direct quoting of G.K.C. in the later preface, may point to a Chestertonian impact on the book. In a world that likes to paint a pretty picture of evil, could it be that Chesterton helped Lewis form the personality of his famous fiends as oppressive, warped, and humorless? Regardless of what one thinks of that theory, it is clear that for Chesterton and Lewis, Satan has actually turned inward toward pride and therefore is rendered joyless. From them, we are reminded that perhaps the people who most need to be concerned about their souls are the ones who can't laugh at themselves. Surely such an attitude is a symptom of spiritual sickness. If we're honest, it's happy humility that we find incredibly refreshing in others and in ourselves. We instinctively enjoy the company of those who have an infectious sense of joy, who are light-hearted, fun-loving, and therefore life-giving. Happy people relax us, draw us in, draw us close, and create space for us to be ourselves. Perhaps that's the one big reason why readers love both Gilbert and Jack. They knew how to laugh at the world and themselves in a healthy, not self-degrading way. Christians can be far too serious about themselves, but Chesterton and Lewis heartily commend the humility of lightness, levity, and laughter over the pride of serious, sober self-righteousness. We don't need to be gloomy, but glad, even in the midst of heartache. Our hurts are real, but even still we can be sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. But even Gilbert and Jack were not always so joyful. Both men had periods of their lives when they were miserable amid the despairing, pessimistic culture of their time, and they longed for something more than the self-serious decadence that dominated, looking for something to grab hold of. They were both drawn towards spiritualism and the occult, but that didn't satisfy them. Looking back on his youth, Chesterton wrote in his autobiography, I had an overpowering impulse to record or draw horrible ideas and images, plunging in deeper and deeper, as in a blind spiritual suicide. I dug quite low enough to discover the devil, and even in some dim way to recognize the devil. For his part, C.S. Lewis wrote of his worldview, Nearly all I loved, I believed to be imaginary. Nearly all that I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. The jolliest of all apologists were once weighted with the same gloom that looms for so many. But God had other plans for them. J.R.R. Tolkien pointed Jack to Jesus as they bonded over beer and Beowulf at Oxford. Reading Chesterton and MacDonald began to weaken Lewis's atheistic defenses. Soon he was beginning to see that there was something real to the Christian faith that fueled so many of his other favorite writers like John Milton, Edmund Spencer, and George Herbert. Years earlier, Gilbert began to find his footing when he ran away from playing with the planchette. His sessions of automatic writing with the Ouija board would leave him with searing headaches, and he had to give it up. 
Finally, in the fall of 1894, Chesterton seemed to have met God in the midst of a fit of depression and left the encounter sensing, quote, the mystically satisfactory state of things. This was a childlike acceptance of the universe. For Gilbert, it was a return to what he had learned in the nursery, what he called his first and last philosophy. As Chesterton came to know Christ, he began seeing the world with the wonder of a child in fairyland, quote, the sunny country of common sense. In Jesus, Gilbert and Jack found the only true source of power and their example for living. They found that humans are never more like the devil than when we are filled with self-focused, joyless pride, and we are never more like Jesus than when we are filled with self-forgetful, happy humility. Too often I have thought of Jesus as eternally sad and serious. How could he not be? He knows the evil in every heart, sees how we treat each other and how we ignore him. Of course Christ takes all this seriously, and the scripture is replete with examples of Christ's sorrow and righteous rage. He certainly wasn't ashamed to overturn tables, weep at the tomb of a friend, or over his beloved rebellious city. But Jesus, even in his divinity, modeled full humanity. His is a humanity that isn't afraid to feel the real emotions of sadness, annoyance, anger, and perhaps most scandalous of all, joy. Christ's love of righteousness, hatred of wickedness, and intimacy with his Father ensures a calm confidence that can only result in delight. The writer of Hebrews confirms that Jesus is indeed infinitely happy, anointed with the oil of gladness beyond his companions. Christ is the one who made fine wine for a wedding, paid the temple tax with a coin found in a fish, and left us with the playful images of the blind leading the blind, a camel squeezing through the eye of a needle, and lilies dressed like kings. At the very end of Orthodoxy, Chesterton points out that joy is the gigantic secret of the Christian. Similarly, Lewis wrote in Letters to Malcolm that joy is the serious business of heaven. Indeed, those who discover this may find it to be their secret weapon while still in this world. God save us from the first sin introduced to this world by the devil, joylessness, the narcissistic mark of those who take themselves too seriously. And God give us grace to laugh, to lighten up, to levitate. God make us like your Christ, the one G.K. Chesterton praised like this at the conclusion of Orthodoxy. There was something that he hid from all men when he went up a mountain to pray. There was something that he covered constantly by abrupt silence or impetuous isolation. There was some one thing that was too great for God to show us when he walked upon our earth. And I have sometimes fancied that it was his mirth. Chapter 11, Loyalty and Longing We here are on the wrong side of the tapestry. Things that happen here do not seem to mean anything. They mean something somewhere else. G.K. Chesterton, Father Brown, The Sins of Prince Sarah Dean In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. That's how Douglas Adams began The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, book two in his best-selling series, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But such a dim view of the cosmos isn't consigned to the biting humor of sci-fi novels. In the academic world, philosopher David Benatar contends that pain and suffering make existence itself an intolerable burden. In his book, Better to Have Never Been, The Harm of Coming into Existence, Benatar espouses the antinatalist philosophy, which believes that it is, quote, morally problematic to bring more sentient beings into existence. The opening sentence of Benatar's book proclaims, each one of us was harmed by being brought into existence. 
These views may sound extreme, but in many ways they accurately reflect the despair at the heart of atheism. That despair is something that C.S. Lewis was intimately acquainted with. We mentioned in the last chapter that prior to his conversion, Lewis himself considered life grim and meaningless. So with that in mind, let's pause to imagine a young Jack Lewis. See him in the quiet confines of his school library, pinning his early epic poem, Loki Bound. Writing from the perspective of the angry Norse god, Lewis lamented, Odin, and who art thou to make a soul and force it into being? Who art thou to bring forth men to suffer in the world without their own desire? This boy would become one of the greatest apologists of the 20th century, but at the time he was troubled by existence itself. He would write later, in Surprised by Joy, about the thoughts he'd had while writing the tragic poem. My Loki was not merely malicious. He was against Odin because Odin had created a world, though Loki had clearly warned him that this was a wanton cruelty. Why should creatures have the burden of existence forced on them without their consent? From his early teens, Lewis had, quote, very definitely formed the opinion that the universe was, in the main, a rather regrettable institution. That sounds like Douglas Adams, doesn't it? One might, understandably, try to trace Lewis's pessimism to the early death of his mother, but he admits that even before that tragedy, he had a, quote, settled expectation that everything would do what you did not want it to do, end quote. Lewis further admitted, Loki was a projection of myself. I was at this time living, like so many atheists or anti-theists, in a world of contradictions. I maintained that God did not exist. I was also very angry with God for not existing. I was equally angry with him for creating a world. Now let us leave that darkened library and look instead for a moment over the shoulder of an adult C.S. Lewis. We are somewhere in the mid-1930s, not so long after his conversion to Christianity. Lewis has a pencil in hand, but he's no longer writing Loki bound. Instead, he's reading. He's reading orthodoxy. And he's taking notes. In the fifth chapter of the book, woven over 11 pages, Lewis noticed a recurring theme or thread. This man, who had once thought of creation as cruelty, now saw Chesterton calling for a supernatural loyalty to life. On the end sheet of his book, Lewis penciled down the overall premise, the page numbers, and the chapter containing the passages he wanted to recall. He wrote Loyalty 2 and marked page 119, 124, and 130 from Chapter 5, The Flag of the World. Under that, Lewis was even more specific and listed three partial quotes to serve as guideposts on the page. He wrote, In the last chapter it has been said, page 119, the evil of the pessimist is then, page 124, the man who kills a man, kills a man, page 130. We turned to page 119 in Lewis's copy of Orthodoxy and found the first paragraph he had wanted to remember. In the last chapter, uh, it has been said that the primary feeling that this world is strange and yet attractive is best expressed in fairy tales. Whatever the reason, it seemed and still seems to me that our attitude towards life can be better expressed in terms of a kind of military loyalty than in terms of criticism and approval. My acceptance of the universe is not optimism, it is more like patriotism. It is a matter of primary loyalty. The world is not a lodging house at Brighton, which we are to leave because it is miserable. It is the fortress of our family, with the flag flying on the turret, and, and the more miserable it is, the less we should leave it. The point is, not that this world is too sad to love, or too glad not to love. The point is that when you do love a thing, its gladness is a reason for loving it, and its sadness a reason for loving it more. Five pages later, Lewis saw the thread continuing. This time, Chesterton was directly pointing out the flaws of two equally wrong positions, pessimism 
and optimism. The evil of the pessimist is, then, not that he chastises gods and men, but that he does not love what he chastises. He has not this primary and supernatural loyalty to things. What is the evil of the man commonly called an optimist? Obviously, it is felt that the optimist, wishing to defend the honor of this world, will defend the indefensible. He is the jingo of the universe. He will say, my cosmos right or wrong. He will be less inclined to the reform of things. We say there must be a primal loyalty to life. The only question is, shall it be a natural or a supernatural loyalty? Lewis continued following the thread that led naturally, soberly, to Chesterton's striking thoughts on suicide. Not only is suicide a sin, it is the sin. It is the ultimate and absolute evil, the refusal to take an interest in existence the refusal to take the oath of loyalty to life. The man who kills a man, kills a man. A man who kills himself, kills all men. As far as he is concerned, he wipes out the world. That difficult passage, while perhaps not taking into account the role that genuine mental illness often plays in suicide, does highlight the hopelessness and disdain for existence that many people feel. It's understandable that atheists and antinatalists would doubt the goodness of life itself. From their perspective, it even makes analytical sense. For them, there exists matter, there exists time, and there exists natural selection. There is pain, but no point. There are no flags flying on the turrets of a fairy land, and they feel no real love for what they chastise. From the atheist position, this view even makes emotional sense, for people carry hurts every day that are so deep it would do them a disservice to describe here. Suicide is therefore the cold, coherent extreme of this worldview taken to its tipping point. At its logical end, such a view would wipe out the world by wishing it had never come to exist at all. In the same way, that young Lewis and his literary Loki were right to hate creation if Odin really was the source. Lewis and his Loki saw a world of wanton cruelty precisely because they didn't see it as the work of a loving God. If indeed we were made by Odin, one deity in a panoply of gods, a power-hungry wanderer to whom human sacrifices were often made, we would have a right to gripe. But there was something or someone pulling at Lewis that wouldn't let him stay in his anger and confusion. He had friends in the flesh, and let's say friends in folios and fantasies that showed him glimmers of something beyond this broken world. As he spoke with friends like Tolkien and read men like Chesterton and MacDonald, another world began to invade his own. This world didn't awaken his contempt, but his curiosity. In this world, even the shadows were bright shadows. And it's here I must contend that C.S. Lewis's loyalty to life can best be understood in a beautiful and mysterious longing. A longing, a desire for something very real, but not yet fully reached. It was a longing that lingered with Lewis through his mother's death and his doubts, through his bleak days at boarding school, and the horrors of the First World War. No doubt this longing was with him as he mourned the death of his dear joy and as he faced the tedious, everyday struggles we all privately endure. This theme appears consistently throughout his writings. It's in his letters, his fiction, and his philosophy. Lewis's entire published sermon, The Weight of Glory, is essential reading on the nature of our longing. This subject emerges so often in his work that I had a very hard time deciding which quotes to include. I resigned myself to pulling a few passages from his novels and his apologetic works spanning many years of his career. We find Lewis writing about this longing in his space trilogy when his character Elwyn Ransom meets a familiar fragrance on Venus. The cord of longing which drew him to the invisible isle seemed to him at that moment to have been fastened long, long before his coming to Perilandra, long before the earliest times that memory 
could recover in his childhood before birth, before the birth of man himself, before the origins of time. It was sharp, sweet, wild, and holy all in one. The longing is also clearly expressed in this famous passage from Mere Christianity. The Christian says creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand, never to despise, or to be unthankful for, these earthly blessings, and on the other, never to mistake them for something else, of which they are only a kind of copy, or echo, or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under, or turned aside, I must make it the main object of life, to press on to that country and to help others to do the same. Lewis talks of the longing again in The Problem of Pain, the very book in which he tackles suffering head-on. There have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether, in our heart of hearts, we have ever desired anything else. You may have noticed that the books you really love are bound together by a secret thread. You know very well what is the common quality that makes you love them, though you cannot put it into words. Again, you have stood before some landscape which seems to embody what you have been looking for all your life. Are not all lifelong friendships born at the moment when at last you meet another human being who has some inkling of that which you are born desiring, and which, beneath the flux of other desires, and in all momentary silences between the louder passions, night and day, year by year, from childhood to old age, you are looking for, watching for, listening for. C.S. Lewis thought his final novel, Till We Have Faces, was his most mature. With his wife, Joy, he wrote a retelling of the myth of Cupid and Psyche, and the book features yet another beautiful passage. At one point, Psyche says, The sweetest thing in all my life has been the longing, to reach the mountain, to find the place where all the beauty came from, my country, the place where I ought to have been born. Do you think it all meant nothing, all the longing, the longing for home? For indeed, it now feels not like going, but like going back. Lewis knew that the world is broken and fallen. As a Christian, he was never the jingo of the universe. He was never an optimist. But amid that acknowledgement, Jack's natural ache for a better world became a supernatural longing, a longing that helped lead Lewis to the supernatural loyalty Chesterton spoke of. This world is something that God has given us, and in it we find enjoyment, noble work, and daily opportunities to know our Maker through His Son. But paradoxically, proper loyalty to this world must include a look beyond to the promise of the one to come. Seeing hints of our future home, our promised glory, right here in this good rubble, actually enables us to endure, to love, to serve. In Christianity, the thought of heaven is not rosy-colored escapism, but a longing for a person. After all, the essence of heaven is the presence of God. Lewis knew this and was constantly reminding himself in the midst of his own pleasures and pains that, quote, my true good is in another world and my only real treasure is Christ. 
he even began to see that his longing, quote, never had the kind of importance he once gave it, but instead was valuable only as a pointer to something other and outer. In the aforementioned The Weight of Glory, Lewis explains that our deepest longings are only satisfied in our being known by God. The sense that in this universe we are treated as strangers, the longing to be acknowledged, to meet with some response, to bridge some chasm that yawns between us and reality, is part of our inconsolable secret. And surely from this point of view, the scriptural promise of glory becomes highly relevant to our deep desire. For glory meant good report with God, acceptance by God, response, acknowledgement, and welcome into the heart of things. The door on which we have been knocking all our lives will open at last. And on the other side of that door, the faithful will find a pleased Father and a loving Savior. The most complete rebuttal the Christian has for the atheist is Christ. The most full defense for life is that the one who gives it is also the one who lived it. Jesus proved that life on this earth is worth living by joining us down here in the dirt. His flesh that can feel the prick of a thorn proves our flesh isn't something to scorn. His tears at the tomb hint that yours will be noticed. His beating heart instructs us to steward each beat of our own. His sweat shows that pain does have purpose. His shed blood gives meaning to any we might shed in his service. The Apostle Paul admits that if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But he goes on to declare that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus reveal the inherent worth of existence. Because in life, we find the opportunity to love, serve, and know our Heavenly Father, who is of supreme worth. He is our treasure. He is the one from whom all blessings flow and the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings of our hearts for all eternity. Near the end of Surprised by Joy, Lewis recounts the now famous final step of his conversion. I was driven to Whipstade one sunny morning. When we set out, I did not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And when we reached the zoo, I did. He would go on to describe the sheer beauty of the place. Wallaby Wood, with the birds singing overhead and the bluebells underfoot and the wallabies hopping all around one, was almost Eden come again. It seems right that a man who once despised creation itself would be found by God, like a child, in a zoo that called to mind the original good garden. It also seems fitting to note that Lewis felt they have spoiled Whipsnade since then. Yet another reminder that earthly Edens never last. Not long after that conversion, Lewis wrote from the kilns to his dear friend, Arthur Greaves. The letter, dated December 4, 1932, illustrates how profoundly his worldview had changed. It is a very consoling fact that so many books about real lives, biographies, autobiographies, letters, etc., give one such an impression of happiness in spite of the tragedies they all contain. Perhaps the tragedies of real life contain more consolation and fun and gusto than the comedies of literature. He continued on and delivered a paragraph of such stark beauty that it's amazing such prose appears in anyone's letters. I wish you could see this place at present. The birch wood is a black, bristly mass with here and there a last red leaf. The lake is cold, cold lead color. The new moon comes out over the fir trees at the top, and a glorious wail of winds comes down from them. I certainly like my garden better at winter than at any other time. 
Lewis had become a man who finally saw something lovable lurking in life, even amid the winter chill. His letter is a painterly depiction from someone learning to live with the loyalty of those last red leaves. Lewis clung to his branch, but only until the day that he would finally hear those words all Christians long to hear. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. We hope you've enjoyed Gilbert and Jack, What C.S. Lewis Found Reading G.K. Chesterton by Alan C. Duncan. This has been a presentation of the Public Square Media Network. This production was executive produced by David Zanotti, directed, edited, and mixed by Alan C. Duncan, recorded by Alan C. Duncan and Rupert Stutchbury, hosted by Joanna Duncan, read by the author with music by the author, and featuring Rupert Stutchbury as G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis. Audio production first published in 2020 by the American Policy Roundtable. Text copyright 2020 by Alan C. Duncan, all rights reserved.